Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. It's starting to get warm enough that I don't have to wear the sweaters anymore, but it's been a weird, um, it's been a different winter, uh, summer here. And the summer we've had here reminds me of the winter we had where we had hardly any rain during the winter. And it wasn't much of a winter, it felt like a, a spring. And um, this summer doesn't feel much like a summer, it feels more like a spring. A few nights ago we had thunderstorms. Uh, at night and it shook the whole house and we had some rain and I've talked to people that have lived here and they said in 15 years they lived here it's the first time they've had rain in August. Uh, usually this is a time period where it starts getting up to 90 degrees to 100 degrees during the day but it's been very uh, foggy in the mornings the sun comes out in the evenings and it's gotten up to 90 degrees yesterday it got up to 90 degrees on the deck but that's my deck um, when I go for a walk, it feels like 80 degrees. Um, but that's a little side note. Um, so I pray that the brethren are doing good. Today we're going to get into a study. Uh, another real quick thing. The reason it's been a while since the study of Jesus Christ is I've been dealing with some things. And one of the things I'm dealing with is the wood stove, trying to get a lot of the wood done, um, my health. So I apologize that it's been a while. Uh, but we're going to get right into this. This might be a long study. And once again, I'll try to break it up. Hopefully nothing gets in the way of me breaking it into two parts, like last time. But today we're going to have a study called, What is the Unpardonable Sin for Today? See, that's the key word there. Okay, Open your Bibles to 2 Timothy 2.15. I have this by heart, but it's always good to always open, be in the habit of opening the Bible and look into it. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Okay. It reads, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing is where dispensations come in. Realizing what's written for us, the whole Bible, but what's written, written to us in this time period. Okay. What confuses brethren is that the question gets asked, what is the unpardonable sin, period? Question mark, period. If you want to say, what's the unpardonable sin? Well, but it says Christ, all through the Bible, there's all kinds of unpardonable sins. All through the Bible. The correct question to be asking yourself is, is there an unpardonable sin today? What's called, what we're going to get into, what's called the time of the Gentiles. From the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ. Okay? This dispensation, which we call the church age sometimes, but the Bible, Jesus calls it the time of the Gentiles. Okay, it's where salvation is no longer just for the Jewish people, it goes out to the whole world. It's for everybody. Okay. The right question is, what is the unpardonable sin today? This dispensation. Is there an unpardonable sin today? Okay. Right. Rightly dividing. We just read that. Rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's what we're going to do today. The problem uh, some people have uh, I talked with one man, a young man, for two hours, two t periods of two hours on Messenger, Facebook Messenger, about he believes we're going into the time of Jacob's trouble. And by the time I got done with him, it was clear that the man was not dispensational. And he kept grabbing from the Old Testament, Jesus Christ talking to the Jews, warning about the Jews that go into the time of Jacob's trouble. He's given the warning. Matthew, uh, was it uh, Matthew chapter 24? Uh... Mark and Luke, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are three books that have chapters where God is warning them about the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob's trouble. Jacob's another word for Israel. And they'll grab that and say, see, the church goes through that time period. They're grabbing from another dispensation when Jesus was physically present on the earth, his earthly ministry, where he's preaching uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The he's trying to bring in the day of the Lord. But they rejected him, so the day of the Lord got put off. Okay. They're grabbing from a different dispensation that's talking about another dispensation, and they're trying to apply it to today. Okay. The question isn't, because you'll, you'll get deceived, brothers and sisters Christ, so easy. If the question was, what is the unpardonable sin? Well, there's tons of unpardonable sins. You go through the Old Testament, the Levitical laws, the Ten Commandments. You can lose your inheritance. You can be treated as if you're not a Jew anymore talking about the Jewish people, there was a lot of unpardonable sins where you were stoned to death. Okay? There's lots of unpardonable sins. The real question you got to ask yourself, brothers and sisters Christ, is what is the unpardonable sin today? 
And we're going to go through some things that they claim is an unpardonable sin. We're going to talk about five of them today. And we're going to try to see if that applies to today. There are many unpardonable sins that we could touch on, but to, do they apply to the time of the Gentiles, the church age? Okay, like I said, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ. This is our time period, and this is what matters the most. We can get all kinds of learning, instruction, and righteousness going all throughout the Bible. But doctrine, when someone says doctrinally, this is for today, it needs to be in the Pauline epistles. Okay. It can be, it can be mentioned in the Gospels as long as it's re-mentioned in the Pauline epistles. It can be mentioned in Hebrews, because Hebrews is a transition book from the Jews going from today, those who reject Jesus Christ that go into the time of Jacob's trouble. You can get saved today, so you don't have to go into the time of Jacob's trouble to the Jews. But it's a transition book, so there's going to be some things that overlap, but it better be in the Pauline epistles. Okay, remember, Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. God ordained him the apostle toward the Gentiles, and that's what his command was given by God. And that power was given to him of God to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Okay. We've got to get into the dispensations, but here are the five unpardonable sins that we'll be talking about in this study, because some people, and you're going to be shocked with one of them, because some people... Take them out of context, okay? One, we're going to talk about blaspheming the Holy Ghost. You'll have certain false religions out there that will, they want you to be in bondage. That's what all this is about, brothers of Christ. They want you back under bondage. They, the leaders of these uh, cults, leaders of these false religions, they want to have control over the people. And the way you have control over the people is you keep them afraid, fearful of their salvation. Okay? Fear. Uh, you keep them, that's one of the biggest ways of keeping them under control is you keep them fearful. Dependent on you for salvation, those leaders of that false religion, and fearful. Right? The Bible says we're not given a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Okay? I'm getting ahead of myself, but the Bible for us says we're sealed into the day of redemption. You get people to doubt their salvation, you, you start installing fear. And then for them to have the insurance of salvation, you get them to be dependent on you. I'm talking about the person that's leading that false religion, the leaders of those false religions. Okay? But you have blaspheming the Holy Ghost. We're going to talk about that real quick. Is that an unpardonable sin? Yes. But is that for today? Two, betraying the Son of Man. Is that an unpardonable sin? Absolutely. But is that for today? Okay? Get into some interesting things under that one. Number three, we're going to talk about offending the little ones. Right? Is that an unpardonable sin? It sounds like one. Well, we're going to read it. It sounds like one. But is that for today? Right? Uh, mark of the beast. That's a big one. Mark of the Because like I said, I just got finished talking with a guy who thinks we're going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. Well, the time of the Gentiles, which we're going to read about, today... I'm going to just jump the gun and tell you. Today, there is no unpardonable sin. just want to throw that in there. There is no such thing as an unpardonable sin for today. But to make the church go through that time period, they try to add the mark of the beast. But the mark of the beast, is that an unpardonable sin? Absolutely. You take the mark, you worship the beast, and we're going to get into the verses. You take the mark, you worship the beast. You lose, if you're saved, you lose your salvation, and you're destined for hell. If you are lost... You continue to be lost, and there's no way you can ever get saved if you've taken the mark and you worship the beast. Okay? But they, people that, that mess all this stuff up what we're talking about are people that are non-dispensational. You'll find that out, Brother Jesus Christ. People that are non-dispensational. They don't know how to rightly divide the word of truth. They just slap it all together and say, it's for us all today. No, it isn't. We can learn instruction and righteousness. We can learn from every one of these unpardonable sins and their dispensation. It's not ours. We can learn from it. But when you doctrinally say it applies to us today, you're dealing with somebody who's lost, someone who's confused, someone who might be newly saved, but they're a PWC, poly one cracker. They're just parroting what, whoever it is they're following. What they say, I've got to say because I'm of him. You get respecters of persons. But people that are, don't rightly divide the word of truth, this isn't their final authority. It's basically who you're dealing with. The word of God is not their final authority. If anybody says there's an unpardonable sin today, right? 
So four was the mark of the beast we're going to be talking about. Five, here's a big one. What about the sin of unbelief? People say that that's an unpardonable sin. The sin of unbelief is an unpardonable sin. We're going to get into that. Is that an unpardonable sin? Let's ask Paul. Let's, let's, let's actually say, let's say the scriptures. Let's ask Paul if that's an unpardonable sin. Okay. So let's get to the first one. Make sure you get your King James Bibles out. It's God's perfect written word in English. Okay, it's where you find the Holy Scriptures. It's in the King James Bible. Okay, sometimes it's called the Authorized Version. Okay, but the first thing we're going to talk about is blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Turn to Matthew chapter twelve. Is this an unpardonable sin? If I get asked that question, I'm going to just jump the gun and tell you yes. But is that for today? Let's read it. Matthew 12, 22. Okay. Then was brought into him one possessed with the devil. This is Jesus Christ. When possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is this is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Okay? Let's keep going. 25. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. Now I want to go back for a second. This is just a side note. And every city or house divided against itself cannot stand. Paul says that, brothers and sisters of Christ, we as the body of Christ... You know, the, the house of God, which is made up of the church of the living God, okay? We're supposed to be of the same mind and of the same judgment, and we're supposed to be striving together. We're supposed to be standing firm together. This is our foundation in all matters of faith and practice. You know why the church, I believe the body of Christ, is in a... In a, is in a it, if it was like health, they're on, almost on life support. Why? Because we are not of the same mind. We're not all of the same judgment. We're not all striving together. We're not all standing firm as this is our final authority of all matters of faith and practice. Okay? We read right here. How, um, a city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Brothers and Christ, this is our final authority. And we just read up there, where to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But, should, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase into more ungodliness. There are brethren out there that aren't shunning and profane and vain babblings. Okay? Like I said, someone comes along and says, hey, you can lose your salvation today. And the church, what we call the church age, but it's called the time of the Gentiles. Okay, but shame, profane, and vain babblings. Oh, the church goes into the time of Jacob's trouble. But shame, shun, profane, profane, and vain babblings. Oh, here, the Bible says Godhead, and the, the Bible teaches that it's God and the person of Jesus Christ. But here, let me tell you about the Trinity. Three gods. Okay. But shun, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. It's destroying the body of Christ, because this is not our final authority. It is for a lot of us, brothers and sisters, but it's not all of us. This is not our final authority. There's brethren getting distracted by the world. This could be its own study. I didn't mean to go off on a little bit of a, a rabbit trail. Please forgive me, but brothers and Christ, we need to be coming together and standing firm together. This is our final authority. Not this. Not the flesh. Not the distractions that's going on in the world. Not worldliness. Not news. This is our final authority, and this is how we're supposed to live. Right? Jesus says himself, right now they're accusing Jesus Christ that he's casting out devils 
through the devil, through Beelzebub, okay, for prince of the devils. In other words, Satan is, is attacking Satan. Satan's destroying himself. And Jesus says that the house cannot stand if it's attacking itself. That goes along with us too, brothers and Christ. We need to stop attacking each other. We need to stand for truth. And yes, cast out people that are teaching false doctrines. Cast out people that are not Bible-believing Christians. Preach the gospel to them and pray that someday they get saved so we can bring them back in. But when it comes to this, this is our final authority, and we need to stop bickering and fighting over things that aren't worth fighting over. Right? That's why I did that whole series of um, words to no profit. There's some people that are just fighting to fight, arguing to argue. They just have the spirit of, of arguing and fighting. Right? Verse 26, sorry, but let's get back to the study. Verse 26, and as Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then, therefore, they shall be your judges? I'm sorry. But whom the children... I'm sorry. And if Satan cast out Satan, verse 26, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. Today, brothers and Christ, this is our final authority. This is what judges. And it will rightly divide. Okay? Paul and epistles, that's my best advice I can give to you. When someone comes to you and says, doctrinally, this is for today, you say, okay, chapter and verse in the Pauline epistles where Paul re talks about it. Yeah, it was, it's, in, it's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but where is Paul reiterating it? Oh, yeah, it's in Hebrews, but where is Paul telling us and warning the body of Christ for today? Where is he warning us about it? Okay, it's over in Revelation. John had a, had a, had a revelation, but where is Paul? Paul warning the church today. Where is John warning the church today in 1st and 2nd and 3rd John? Okay. That's the important thing to remember. This is going to judge whether what someone's teaching is true when you rightly divide the word of truth, the King James Bible. Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? Remember that the devil, by the capital S Spirit of God, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, All matter of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And that's why they get this, okay? So they blaspheme the Holy Ghost, it will not be forgiven. It's an unpardonable sin. Let's keep reading, verse 32. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall, not, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now, we're not going to get into this whole study on the word world. When Sometimes when the word world is used, it's talking about a time period. This world, time period, Jesus is physically present on the earth. God is on the earth, manifest in the likeness of sinful flesh and the body of Jesus Christ, his capital S Son. That's why it's capital S Son of God. It's not God the Son. That's heresy. That's Satanism. That's a false God. It's capital S Son of God. God manifest in the flesh. Okay. When he was physically there, that's the world he's talking about when he says this world. And then when he says in the world to come. Sorry about that. I'm sorry, brother, it's Christ. Sorry for the instruction, but he's saying in this world, this world, okay, he's talking about where he's physically present. And blaspheming the Holy Ghost is saying that instead of Jesus having, Jesus A, it starts out with, and we're going to get into this, it starts out with Jesus isn't God the Father. He's not God manifest in the flesh. No, he's, he's God the Son. 
He's not the Son, capital S, Son of God. God the Father manifest in the flesh. No, 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 no. He's God the Son. That's what it starts out as. And then the next thing you know is, well, then he doesn't have the Holy Spirit in him. He's got the spirit of a devil. If he's not God, he's just a man. And just being a man, he can be demon-possessed. And he's got a demon in him. He's got a devil in him, not the Holy Spirit. And that's what it is. It can only happen when Jesus is physically present. In this world, where he's physically present, or in the world to come, the day of the Lord. When he comes back and rules and reigns for a thousand years, if you say that he has a devil in him in that time period, it will not be forgiven. You say he has a devil in that time period where he's on the earth trying to bring in the day of the Lord, but it got put off, remember? Those who've studied the Bible, the day of the Lord is a thousand year period, to a thousand years where Jesus is going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. All right? He got put off. All right? But that's what he was bringing in when he was on the earth in the likeness of sinful flesh. But the Jews rejected him. So it got put off. Those are the two time periods where this is an unpardonable sin. And yes, it is. You commit this sin, you go to hell. And then the lake of fire for all eternity. But is that for today? No. Where is Jesus right now? Jesus is up in heaven. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus is up in heaven right now preparing a place for us. That's where Jesus is right now. And you read that with Stephen when he looks up and sees Jesus standing. Is Jesus going to come back? Are the Jews going to accept him or are the Jews going to reject him? And they end up stoning Stephen and they rejected him. And so he sets back down. Jesus didn't come back at that time period. And where's Jesus at right now? He's in heaven. So does this apply to today? Okay. John 5.17. Turn to John 5.17. Why do I say this about, it always starts out with you saying that Jesus, today what happens is, is people get told that Jesus is not God, the Father. And if he's not God, the Father, then he's not God, period. There's only one, 1 Corinthians 8.6, there's only but one capital G, God, the Father. There's only one God, one God, one God. We serve one God, we serve a living God. One God. Okay. Uh -huh. That's the Father. So turn to John 5.17. Notice this is still all the Old Testament. But where is it at in the Pauline epistles? It's not there. John 5.17. But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Remember, he says, I and my Father are one. God the Father is the soul. God the Father is the true God. And he speaks to mankind through his body, the capital S, Son of God, and through his Spirit, the Holy Spirit. That's how he does it. That's why you have a capital W word for Jesus Christ, and you have a lowercase w word for when the Holy Spirit is speaking through men, as they, remember, as men were moved, as they were, they spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We get the word of God through men that, that, are, that have the Holy Ghost in them, and we get the word of God the Father through his flesh, through his body, flesh and bones, his body, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. When he speaks, it's God the Father speaking. When the Holy Spirit speaks through men, it's God the Father speaking through them. Right? It's that simple. Made himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The capital S Son can do nothing of himself. It's God the Father working it through him. But what he seeth the Father, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. It's God the Father working through Jesus Christ. When you're looking at Jesus Christ, you see God the Father. He that it, when Philip asked Jesus, show us the Father, Jesus says, Has that been a long time with me? Has thou not known me, Philip? Me? He's the body of, of God the Father. When he speaks, it's God the Father speaking through him. Why is this hard for some people? Well, they're either newly saved and confused, or they don't have the Holy Spirit in them, and this book is not their final authority. But let's keep going. Why am I reading this? Because it starts out with you separate Jesus from God the Father. 
And if you do that, because that's what they did, they denied Jesus Christ being God the Father. And in so doing, they felt comfortable to say, he has a devil in him. He's just a man. He's just a prophet. How many false religions do we have today that say he's just a prophet? Well, Jesus was real, but he's just a man. He's just a prophet. Now they can say he was possessed with the devil. Verse 20, For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Did Jesus not raise people from the dead? That's something only God the Father can do. But he can do it through Jesus Christ, the capital S Son of God, because Jesus is God the Father. Verse 22, for the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. And we're going to get this into some of the other topics. Who's sitting on the great white throne? Jesus Christ. Who's sitting on, I believe it's the same throne, but it's two different time periods. When it says great white throne, it's after the, after the thousand years of Jesus' reign, the day of the Lord. It's in Revelation. And then you have the judgment seat of Christ, which is going to happen when we get caught up. Okay? They're still the same throne, it's just two different time periods where God, God the Father through Jesus Christ, will be judging the world. The okay. Bible says, Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, though so that every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. See, you dishonor the Son when you say, Jesus is not God the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. So it starts out with simply saying, well, Jesus isn't God the Father. No, that's okay. Uh, Philippians 2.5. Philippians 2.5. I've been asked this before. Well, then, what did Mary give birth to? I'll show you what Mary gave birth to. Mary gave birth to God manifest in the likeness of sinful flesh. I'll just give the answer right now. But Philippians 2.5. Philippians 2.5. Let this mind be in you, brothers and sisters of Christ, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, what form? He's the body of God. He's the flesh. He's the express, the Bible says he's the express image of God. He that has seen me has seen the Father. I and my Father are one. The form of God. But what kind of form of God? Because I believe in the Old Testament when it said angel of the Lord, it's talking about Jesus Christ. You have Nebuchadnezzar looking in the fire with Meshach, I get the names, Abednego, and I get the names mixed up with the three, three people there, and he sees a fourth person and says it's like unto the Son of God. Jesus had an incorruptible body in the Old Testament, but here it says who being in the form of God, but what form is it talking about? Let's keep reading. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made. Because some people get confused and say, well, Jesus was created. He wasn't the Old Testament. Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, incorruptible body, was not created. What was created was this right here. And was made in the likeness of sinful, um, in the likeness of men. When he was born of a virgin Mary... He was born as a, in the likeness of sinful flesh, which we're going to get to that in the, in the next set of pictures. But right here it says, was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Why did he act the way he did? If he's God the Father, why did he act the way he did? Why did he talk the way he did? He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. He spoke the way he spoke so we could understand it and we can learn from it. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth. Okay? Everybody. That's at the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, at the end of the day of the Lord, hell's brought up. Everybody has to stand before Jesus Christ. Kneel, not say stand, but kneel. Usually we say stand, in other words you have to answer when you use the word stand, but physically they're going to be kneeling before Jesus Christ in the earth that's where hell is and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father so we see that he was made in the likeness of men he came in the likeness of men that's what, what Mary gave birth to 
God the Father manifest in the flesh. Turn to Romans 8, 1. Romans 8, 1 is where we get... Romans 8, 1 is where we get this. Uh, this whole chapter, I keep pointing to some brethren because they don't... They got on to me when I did that series of studies, Brother Says Christ, on can you be carnally minded and walking after the flesh as a saved sinner? And according to the scriptures, the answer is no. That's how the scriptures, this whole chapter, divides lost from saved. You're either capital S, spiritually minded, walking after the spirit. You can struggle. You can fall on your face. You have good fruit, and every once in a while you might bear bad fruit. But for the most part, you're capital S, spiritually minded, and you're walking after the spirit. The lost world is carnally minded, walking after the flesh. That's the separation. Right? When Paul says, prove your own selves, are you spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit? Walking, living, this book is being hid in your heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. And you're living it. When he says, prove it, prove it. Are you living this book? Uh -huh. Where's the Holy Spirit? Romans 8.1 there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Oh, no, no, but you can lose your salvation. No condemnation. To them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. What did Mary give birth to? God the Father coming down in a physical form, the body, body, soul, and spirit. God the Father is the soul. The Holy Spirit is the spirit. The Son of God is the body. He gave up His incorruptible body and came down in the likeness of sinful flesh. God sent His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Right? And for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Remember, Jesus' incorruptible body was incapable of, uh, couldn't take on the sins of the world. But God sent His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Now, Jesus, the Son of, capital S, Son of God, can take on the sins of the world. He's in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was still perfect. He was still sinless. Some, and I've heard some brothers slip up and say he's a sinner. No, he's not a sinner. He took on the sins of the world. When he was on the cross. But he himself was never a sinner. He was perfect. We're going to get this a little bit later. But he was perfect. He kept all the law, Levitical laws. He didn't break any of them. He never had to do an animal sacrifice to cover his sins. He did the regular animal sacrifices like he was supposed to when it came to, to the laws, the Levitical laws. But in the Old Testament, there was times where if you did this sin, you had to give this sacrifice. If you did that sin, you had to do this sacrifice. If you did this sin, you had to do it this way. To cover the blood would cover those sins. Jesus never had to do any of that. He never sinned. He was perfect. But he took on the sins of the world. He took on my sins. But as Christ, he took on your sins. If you're lost and you're watching this, he took on your sins. Okay. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who's the us? Saved sinners. The righteousness of the law isn't fulfilled in lost people. It's only fulfilled in those who come to the cross broken in true biblical repentance. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world work of death. And that's what keeps people from getting saved mostly. Sorrows of the world. True biblical repentance. Coming to the cross having sorrow for your personal sins that you've sinned against God. It's your sins that put them on the cross. Not the world as a whole. I can say that when we do teachings, but when I came to the cross broken to get saved, I had to come to the cross saying my sins are what mattered as far as he died for my sins. It's not about him dying for that person's sins over there or that person's sins over there or the world's sins. Oh, it's my personal sins that he died for. You have to come to the cross like that because only then can you throw the old man. When I say throw the iniquities at the foot of the cross, you're throwing the old man at the foot of the cross. You're giving your life to Jesus Christ at the cross. And then you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ, which is why you throw your life at the foot of the cross. You believe that Jesus can save you. His blood can wash your sins away. 
that Jesus is God the Father manifest in the flesh. It was God's blood that was shed on the cross. Okay, we go through scripture after scripture. Feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Talking about God the Father. When Jesus bled on the cross, it wasn't some prophet and some regular man's blood that was shed. It was God's blood that was shed on the cross. You have to believe that it was God's blood that was shed on the cross and that Jesus died to pay for your sins. And we've done that, brothers of Christ. But I'm more pointing out that anybody's lost that's watching this. Anybody that got suckered into a false, easy believism. You don't come to the cross broken, throwing the old man, giving your life, that's throwing the old man at the foot of the cross so God can give you a new man, a new life, after salvation. It starts with repentance. It goes to belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You confess both in prayer. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Unto means it leads to salvation. It leads to God saving you. You need to confess your repentance and your belief. You can do it in prayer before God. You can do it openly. You confess it. And then you ask God to save you. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay? God looks at the heart. Okay? The righteousness of the law might be fulfilled. It's in us. Who's the us? Those who went through the true plan of salvation. That I just listed right there. Those of us who truly got saved, the righteousness of the law is fulfilled. Why? Because we went through Jesus Christ. We didn't go through this. If you try going through this, this lets us know the laws are a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. But if you tried to go through this to get saved, have fun with that. You'll fail every time. Every time. The righteousness of the law was, was fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. That's the evidence that the righteousness was fulfilled in us. We have the Holy Spirit. But after the spirit... For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the carnally for to be carnally minded is death. Stop right there. I, I don't mean to go back in some of the old teachings, brothers of Christ, but right there. For to be carnally minded is death. The law of sin and death. Oh, you can be a carnally minded, you can be carnally minded and still be a Christian. You can be carnally minded. Well, according to the scriptures, no, you can't. But, what negates that? But, how do you get out of that death, the law of sin and death? But to be spiritually minded is life and peace, true salvation. Being born again, having the Holy Spirit in you. Here we get to it. Because the carnal mind is enemy against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. For instruction righteous, that's true even for a saved man, like me. If I start getting into the flesh, I'm not going to be pleasing God. Can a brother and sister in Christ start backpedaling? Yes. Did Paul warn about not trying to resurrect the old man? Yes. But someone who's truly saved and born again is not going to be carnally minded and walking out the flesh. There's not going to be no change. It's just the old man is still thriving. No, the old man is dead and buried with Jesus Christ on the cross. There's no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Ye are my friends, talk, just Jesus talking, ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. In other words, you gave your life to Jesus Christ on the cross. The old man is dead and buried. And the new man comes up and says, Lord, command me and I will obey. Command me and tell me how I'm supposed to live and what I'm supposed to do and what I'm supposed to believe. Command me, O Lord. I'm yours. So then they that are in the flesh can't please God. When you start falling back into, I can do whatever I want and I can command myself and I can live however I want. You, stop, you start getting into the flesh. Covetousness, which is idolatry. Traditions of men. I see that in the body of Christ. Getting distracted by what's going on in the world. But verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh. Ye are not in the flesh. Who's he talking about? Save sinners. But in the capital S, Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. There we see the Spirit of God. What's the Spirit of God? The Holy Spirit. Here's the next one. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of of Christ. Wait a minute. He just said, if so be that the Spirit of capital G God, there's only one capital G God, the Father. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. 
The reason I kept reading all the way down is God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus is God the Father manifest in the flesh. He has the soul of God. God the Father in him is the soul. When he speaks, God the Father speaking. When he's healing, it's God the Father doing the work through him. We read that. Why is it so hard for some people to understand that Jesus is God fully and completely? And right here we see the Spirit of God dwelling in you. And then it turns around and says, and the Spirit of Christ. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, wait, wait, wait. So there's two different spirits? No, they're one and the same Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. So what Spirit did Jesus Christ have in Him? The Holy Spirit. Okay. Brothers and sisters of Christ, it always starts out with Jesus is not God the Father. Now, more than anything, they just say Jesus isn't God. The lost world, what they do, what we're fighting in the body of Christ is a lot of people are getting in. Hold on just one second as I'm talking. The whole world is getting in and the body of Christ is starting to fight over this thing about is Jesus God? Jesus is God, but Jesus isn't God the Father. Making all kinds of mistakes today. If I didn't plug that in, we would have lost power, brothers and sisters of Christ. We would have lost power. Um, but this big whole argument over it, and it's like, but the lost world doesn't believe Jesus is God, period. Okay, all these false religions don't believe that Jesus is God at all. I did that study, um, uh, the, I looked into that survey, and I showed the reference for that survey, where I got it from, but over half the world's population, I think it was like 3.5 billion people in the world, they believed in a Jesus Christ. But they don't believe in the Jesus Christ that we just read about who is God the Father fully and completely. They're one and the same. When Jesus speaks, it's God the Father speaking. When Jesus is healing, it's God the Father healing. When Jesus is judging, all judgment has been given over to the Son. When Jesus is judging, God the Father is judging through him. Okay. I, we're made in the likeness of God. I have a soul inside this body. My soul is speaking to you through my body. You can't see the soul. You can't see the spirit. I have a spirit, lowercase s spirit, that keeps this body alive. When this body dies, it yields up the ghost, it yields up the spirit. My soul and my spirit flee. And this body just rots and falls apart. Okay? Because this is a sinful flesh body. It starts with God the Father manifests in the, in the likeness of sinful flesh. Okay? I'm sorry, it starts with Jesus is not God the Father. Okay, manifest in the likeness of sinful flesh, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Ah, oh, Jesus isn't really, Jesus is not God the Father, he's not really God. Then the next thing you know, it ha you start talking about, well, then it goes to say he's Satan. He's working for Satan, or he's of the devil, or he's got, you know, he's possessed of the devil, has an evil spirit in him, not the Holy Spirit. Okay. That's how it starts out. And today, are there a lot of people that today that believe Jesus is just a prophet, or he's he's fake, or he's not even real, or whatnot? Or and there's people that say he has a devil. He's just satanic. It's, it's a wicked religion. I'm part of a re, re, wicked religion, and everything. Yeah, there's people that say that today. Okay, remember, but Jesus isn't physically present today. People can say today that Jesus has a devil in him. Uh, he's just, he's a fake, he's a fraud. It, he, it, they can say all kinds of things. Okay, will God forgive that today? Jesus isn't physically present right now. But let's keep reading. Uh, or let's turn to Romans 1, 16. Go back to Romans 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Where's the, where's the fine print? Have you ever heard of the saying, the fine print, when there's a contract, sometimes they try to sneak in some fine print? Where's the clause here that says, unless you've blasphemed the Holy Ghost, unless you've taken the mark and worshiped the beast, unless you've done, blah, blah, where's the clause here? It's not. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his internal power and 
Godhead. So that they were without excuse, because that when they knew capital G God, what, what is it? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was standing right before them, preaching to them, teaching them, healing people, raising people from the dead. When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Well, He's not God, He's just a man. And if He's just a man, He can be demon-possessed. And if He can be demon-possessed, you know what? He's not casting out those demons by the Holy Spirit of God. He's casting them out by devils. You see how that goes? Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Remember the word fool. fool is the, I mean, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. The fool says Jesus isn't God the Father. You might slip up and you're newly saved and you might be parroting what someone else says, but you study the Word of God with the Holy Spirit in you, you're going to get to the point where body's Godhead is God in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus has God the Father in him, the soul. He's got the Spirit of God. And he has the Spirit of Christ. The same Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit in him. Jesus is the body. Body, soul, and spirit. The Godhead. In him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Okay. A fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But brothers and sisters of Christ, we can still use the word foolish for those who are saved. Brothers and sisters of Christ, you're acting foolish. In other words, you're acting like a lost person. Brother Philip, you're acting foolish. Talk about me. What does that mean? I'm acting like a lost person. I'm in error somehow. I'm doing something wrong. Or you're doing something wrong. It's okay to use the word foolish with a brother and sister in Christ. Be careful not to use the word fool. Mm -hmm. Right here it says, imagine, and their foolish heart was darkened. This is past tense, when God walked among them in the body of Jesus Christ. Okay, when they knew God, past tense. They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination. Their foolish heart was, was darkened. But what about today? There's a lot of Jews getting saved at that time period that Paul's writing this. He's leading some Jews to, 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 to Jesus Christ. More Gentiles at this point than Jews, but there are Jews getting saved. Was. That's past tense. Jesus is, capital G, God the Father. And that's where it starts. They kept saying, you keep saying you're, God, you're the capital S Son of God. You're making yourself equal to God. You're not God. You're the devil. When, to Jesus' face. Okay. Romans 1.22, keep reading, professing themselves to be wise. Oh, I've got the answer. He's a devil. And he's casting out through Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. That's how he's casting these things. I am wise. I figured it all out. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Notice it says fools. Remember, I believe it's an unpardonable sin when Jesus is physically present. So those people that said that, he's, he's got, that was an unpardonable sin. They became fools. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to the uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. And that's what's going on today. The truth of God into a lie. Well, Jesus is God, but he's not God the Father. If he's not God the Father, then he, they're saying he's a separate God from God the Father. Period. And when they start saying, but no, 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 there's only one God. You're dealing with someone who's mentally ill, who's lost. I never once believed, and I've talked to brethren, I've never once believed in three gods. And a lot of brethren that use Trinity terms, they'd say, well, I don't believe in three gods either. Well, then stop using the Trinity term because that's what it means, that there are three gods, separate gods. God the Father is not God the Son. God the Son's not the Holy, God the Spirit. There are three separate gods. That's what the Trinity teaches. If you don't believe that, stop using Trinity. Start using the word Godhead. I only believe in one God. That's the Godhead. God the Father works through the Son, capital S, Son, Jesus Christ. God the Father works through the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. 
And Jesus can claim that Holy Spirit as his own. These three are one. Body, soul, and spirit, these three are one. The person of Jesus Christ. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Okay. Today God can and will save anyone. We're going to read the verse for that. Including those that have denied who Jesus is by saying that Jesus is not God the Father, manifest in the flesh, and has not the Holy Spirit of God in him. Okay. Today people can say, well, he was just a man, like past tense, he was just a man that had a devil in him. Is it an unpardonable sin today? No. That's what blaspheming the Holy Spirit is, is saying that Jesus Christ, when he's physically present to his face, you're telling him you're not the Son of God, you're not God manifest in the flesh, you have, you're, you're of Satan, and you have a devil in you. That's what blaspheming the Holy Ghost is. That's what blaspheming the Holy Ghost is, brother says Christ. You have a devil in you, not the Holy Spirit in you. And it can only be done face to face to Jesus Christ. Can people say that today and be forgiven? Absolutely. I'm going to read the verse for that. However, the unpardonable sin of blaspheming the Holy Ghost can only be done when Jesus is physically present. It shall be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither the world to come. Okay? Is this an unpardonable sin? Because that's, that's how they try to deceive you, brothers and Christ. Is this an unpardonable sin? Absolutely it is. Is it for today? Absolutely not. What is for today? Turn to John, 1 John 1.5. 1 John 1. Let's see. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. This is written for the time of the Gentiles, from the death of Jesus Christ, where the New Testament comes in, death of the testator, that's in Hebrews, where the death of the testator comes in, that's the only way the New Testament can come in. Okay, there has to be a shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Okay. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin, from the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ. Cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Let's say you get mad at God and you start cursing God as a saved sinner. I mean, some people can get really low, you can get really fleshly. There's, the Bible talks about, we're going to talk about this a little bit more. The falling away. If you confess your sin, will God forget it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. Okay. When we get to the mark of the beast, they keep saying nobody, no, no person who's, you know how they hide from this? No person who's truly saved will blaspheme the Holy Ghost. No person who's truly saved will take the mark of the beast and worship the beast. What does it say here? If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. We can still fail the Lord big time, brother says Christ, today. We can fail the Lord. We think... I'd never sin that sin again. You might stumble and fall and start resurrecting the old man. Yes, if the mark of the beast was today, would there be brothers and sisters in Christ today that would take the mark of the beast and worship the beast? Absolutely. But that's not for us today. Okay? There are, I've talked to brethren who have backslidden. They have testimonies to try to encourage the brethren not to make the same mistake that they've made. Backslidden. And God will forgive you today. Cleanses from all unrighteousness. Okay. Remember that when Jesus spoke of this unpardonable sin, Jesus had not died on the cross yet. That's a big thing. He had not died on the cross. The death, burial, and resurrection, his blood is shed to wash our sins away, had not even happened yet when he said about talked about this unpardonable sin. Okay. You say, well, what about the day of the Lord? The day of the Lord, Jesus is going to be physically present, and he's going to be ruling and reigning as he was supposed to, when he was trying to bring in the kingdom, 
when he when he talked about this, he was supposed to bring in the kingdom, so it was supposed to carry over to the kingdom. But they rejected him as their king, and the kingdom got put off. Okay. But Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet, and in the day of the Lord, it is 100% works, and the Levitical laws will come back. I'm going to point here the Ten Commandments. But not just the Ten Commandments, but all the Levitical laws are going to come back. Okay. It's going to be 100% works. Whereas today, those laws are nailed to the cross. Colossians chapter 2, 14. I had a brother in Christ that, that was a mentor that he really screwed this verse up. Why? Because he's getting into the world. Worldliness, covetousness, which is idolatry. Colossians 2, 14 says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us. This is against us. The laws of God are a schoolmaster. They're against us. They're a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. To let us know that we cannot fulfill the law. We can't be perfect. Okay? There's no way I can go to heaven of my own works. What happens? They, these Levitical laws that lead to the law of sin and death, which is against you, sending you to hell and burning for all eternity, the law of sin and death, were nailed to the cross, blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. That's Colossians 2.14. Now read all of Colossians 2 sometime. It talks about the old Levitical laws, holy days, Sabbath days, and new moon. It talks about all the ordinances about touch not, taste not, eat not. The Old Testament ordinances. That same brother that lost, that got so prideful and ego-driven, touch not, taste not, eat not, what was that? that, that where's that at in the Bible? That's just gen, that's, um, Gentile culture. No, it's actually in the Old Testament. How you can make a mistake like that? Nailing it to the cross. All that got nailed to the cross. If I touch something that, that, would, that affects my flesh, it's not going to affect my soul. That spiritual circumcision. Okay? My soul is no longer connected to this wicked body. My soul is connected to the body of Jesus Christ. That's why how I'm part of the body of Christ. It's how you are a part of the body of Christ. Okay? It goes back to being 100% Levitical laws in the Old Testament, in the day of the Lord. When Jesus is speaking, the Levitical laws are in play. When he makes this unpardonable sin, the Levitical laws are in play. Why is the day of the Lord the same thing? Because it goes back to being under the Levitical law. Jesus is ruling and reigning with a rod of iron, and the Levitical law comes back in. It becomes 100% works. That's why this only applies to those two time periods. Jesus is not physically present for me to look him in the eye and say he has a devil in him. Where is Jesus Christ at right now? He's in heaven preparing a place for us. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I'll come again. He talks about him coming again to get us. He's going to come get us someday, brothers of Christ. You can use the Lord's name in vain, speak blasphemy, and God will forgive and save anyone that will come to him. Now, understand this. God will forgive you. I know some people that, when it comes to verbal curses and stuff like that, I know this isn't necessarily blaspheming the Holy Ghost. What's blaspheming the Holy Ghost is telling Jesus Christ to his face, physically present, that he doesn't have the Holy Spirit in him, that he has a devil in him. That's what true blaspheming the Holy Ghost is. But today people are so confused. Well, did I blaspheme the Holy Ghost? Because it gets so confused with the lost world. Watering it down, if you cursed God, if you did this, if you, that's blaspheming. If you just, you know, the people who get demon, that are demon possessed, and they start going woobity wobbly, woobity wobbly, woobity wobbly, it's, it's, I'm speaking in tongues, woobity wobbly, woobity wobbly. It's like, uh, no, you're, you got a devil in you. Oh, you just blaspheme the Holy Ghost. That's not blaspheming the Holy Ghost because you aren't Jesus Christ. What does the Bible say in the Old Testament? What did uh, Satan tempt Eve with? You can be as gods, knowing good and evil. Are you trying to act like you're God now all of a sudden? They're not God. That's not blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Okay. But just so you know, God will save any of that. If you blaspheme his name, like when you get saved, if you, as a lost man, you probably just slipped up and you'd use curses and cussing and stuff like that. When you get saved, God's going to get that out of your life pretty quick. It might slip out every now and then a little bit after getting saved, but God will get it out pretty quick. Now, I don't believe that once God has given you a new life that you will do it 
as a saved sinner left and right. In other words, there's no changed life. When you have someone who curses God, who um, cusses left and right, but mainly using curse words, using God's name in vain, okay, if anybody says that, you know, Jesus is, I, don't, I can't see anybody who's truly saved saying Jesus has a devil in him, but, okay, these are oftentimes red flags. When you have someone who says, I've been saved for 20 years, they're cussing left and right, they're using the Lord's name left and right, um, they might slip up and get angry at God and, 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 and just say it out of spite, you have a devil in you today. Okay? I don't believe that, that per, a, a saved person would really want to do that. Okay? But the point for this study is this, not to get into an argument whether a, a saved sinner would say that or not. The point of this study is, is can God still save that man? Absolutely. Let's say he's a false convert. Can God still save that man? Absolutely. Newly saved, you will have to break bad habits of saying those things, but God will get them out of your vocabulary real quick. He helped me. I wasn't a man who cussed a lot. But he helped me get some things out of my vocabulary, the way I would say things. He's helped clean up my life, the things that I would do. So, brothers and Christ, we're going to keep coming back to that 1 John 1, 5. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses from all sin, all unrighteousness. That's for today. Can God forgive somebody that so thinks that thinks they've commit they've uh, com committed what they call the unpardonable sin of blaspheming the Holy Ghost? Can that be forgiven today? A yes, because it's not possible to blaspheme the Holy Ghost today. But even if you're trying to be deceived into it, all things can be forgiven today. That blaspheming the Holy Ghost is only for when Jesus was physically present on the earth, going into the time of Jake, uh, going into the day of the Lord. Why? Because the Levitical laws are what's being done on both dispensations. Jesus hadn't died, it's not belief in the finish, repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that's not there. It's not there in the day of the Lord, it's not there when Jesus' uh, earthly ministry, when he came the light, when God came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Okay? So let's get that out of there. Okay? That's not an unpardonable, that is an unpardonable sin, but is that an unpardonable sin for today? Absolutely not. The next one, because we have a lot to go through. Next one, betraying the Son of Man. The three main ones which we will talk about is the mark of the beast and blasphemy of the Holy Ghost were the two. And then you hear this teaching lately that uh, the sin of unbelief is an unpardonable sin. We're going to get into that, okay? But I threw a couple extra in here just to show that this dispensation that people are grabbing from when Jesus is physically walking on the earth, and it's going to be there for when Jesus is there and the day of the Lord. But it's not there for today, okay? Today, any sin can be forgiven. Anyone can say, are you breathing? Go, ha, ha. Are you breathing? Are you alive? Some of you might be barely alive. God can save you. You have to come to Him broken and repenting and having godly sorrow for your personal sins that put Him on the cross. It's down to you coming to God broken. Can God save you? Absolutely. Two, betraying the Son of Man, Mark 14, 21. Turn to Mark 14, 21. How many you know about this one? Mark 14, 21. The Son of Man indeed goeth, as is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son, capitalist Son of Man, is betrayed, son of man. Remember the two terms, uh, titles that God, that Jesus has. He has capital S, son of man, going back to being King David, that his family lineage through Mary and Mary's marriage to Joseph goes back to King David. That's what son of man is. He's the physical king, and he goes and, he's, and he has a promise. There's a prophecy that he would rule and reign for a thousand years. All right. That's what the Son of Man is. Then you have capital S, Son of God, another title for Jesus saying that he's God manifest in the flesh. So he's God manifest in the likeness of sinful flesh, but he also has that family line that goes back to King David to rule and reign. That's where you get the Son of Man. is betrayed, so God the Father can't be betrayed, but the Son of Man can be betrayed. Whom the Son of Man is betrayed, good for, for him that he had never been born. First, I want to point out this is a specific man. 
Good for that man. That man. It's a specific man would never born if he were never born. Because there's people, and the reason I'm bringing this up is there's people today that believe they betrayed Jesus Christ and the life that they lived before. And, and, they, and it's hard for them to get over that to say, God will still save you. God will forgive all that. Throw that man that, betrayed, that you feel betrayed Jesus, your creator, God Almighty, throw that man at the foot of the cross, the old man, and God will save you and give you a new life. New birth, new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I got the banner rolled up there. So, um, yeah. But you got some people that believe that they've betrayed Jesus Christ and there's no way he would save me. There's no way he would forgive me. This is just talking about a specific man. And it can only be done to the capitalist son of man when Jesus was physically present on the earth in the likeness of sinful flesh. All right. Judas Iscariot, we're going to get to this. Judas Iscariot is that man. Notice it reads that man. This could only be done when Jesus was physically present. But can brethren betray Jesus today? There was an old song that I'm not pro promoting this, the, the man or anything, but an old song came to my memory. It says, only a friend can betray a friend. A stranger has nothing to gain. And only a friend comes close enough to ever cause so much pain. Only a friend can betray a friend. Someone who... Who, who's an enemy and has nothing to do with you. They can hurt you, they can attack you, but they can't betray you. This had to be someone that was close to Jesus Christ, and it was Judas Iscariot. Right. 2 Timothy 2.15. Turn back to 2 Timothy 2.15. You say, we read this. Well, let's keep reading. 2 Timothy 2.15. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Remember, you can pause the video and turn. If I turn too fast, pause the video, turn, and then unpause the video. Right? That's what I do when I watch other brethren's studies. Because I love turning in the Bible to what we're re and reading along. Okay? But study to show thy proof unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But, shame, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth the canker of whom is Hermias and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Brothers of Christ, there's sometimes that you might fall back into temptation and you choose to sin or you start getting into worldliness, distracted by the world, and you get, try to start resurrecting the old man and you think, I've betrayed the Lord. I've betrayed God and He won't forgive me. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. You have two men that once believed in the resurrection that turn their back on the resurrection and start preaching against the resurrection. But the, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, that God knows that them that are His. Part of it is that they're still saved, because it goes and talks about, if you keep reading, um, 19, verse 20, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth, and some to honor, and some to dishonor. Can God forgive you if you feel like you've betrayed Him? We pray, betrayed His word. You turned your back on something that was absolute truth. Can you come back to the truth? Absolutely. Can God forgive you? Absolutely. That betrayal was for a specific man, and when only when Jesus was physically present. Once again, it's a different dispensation. It's not for today. This the Lord knoweth them that are his. Uh, uh, verse 19 in 2 Timothy 15. I did keep writing down here. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. You can fail the Lord, and God will forgive you. You can feel like you betrayed the Lord. You can come back to God, and God will forgive you. And let every one of you that name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's a big one. A lot of easy believisms don't like that verse. Oh, no, 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 because that talks about a changed life. Sanctification. God cleans up your life. Okay. But in great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood, earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Some to honor, some to dishonor. You can dishonor the Lord. Right now, like I said, the state of the body of Christ today is not strong and, and 
as I wish it was. And I, I hope and pray that maybe someday before the catching with the body of Christ, we can all come together and be strong again and work together and strive together, be of the same mind, the same judgment. But right now, this that statement, really, that reads so much true. God knows that they're His, but in the body of Christ, there are some that are gold and silver and some to word and earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. And it's something that you always got to check your life and make sure, am I dishonoring the Lord? Am I dishonoring the Lord by dishonoring His Word? Am I dishonoring the Lord by dishonoring the brethren, how I'm treating the brethren? Okay. 2 Thessalonians 2.1 2 Thessalonians 2, chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye may soon be that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by this, nor by letter as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Okay. There's going to be a falling away, brothers and sisters. There's going to be a great falling away in the time of Jacob's trouble. But there's also a falling away today. Okay. There's a falling away in Peter, and uh, Peter's day, Peter's day, Paul's day. He did, we just read about it. two people who believed in the resurrection, and now they've turned against it. They have erred from the truth. At one point, they had the truth, and then they've erred from it. He didn't say they were ignorant. He didn't say, "Hey, they, they're speaking of what they know not." He said they erred from the truth. In other words, they had the truth, and at some point rejected it. They had it. They're one of us. They had it. They had the truth, and now they've turned from the truth. They've erred from the truth. Mm -hmm. You'll have brethren fall away from the truth today and betray Jesus in his word. Even betray some of the brethren. Some will stay in a fallen state till caught up in death. No, father chastens uh, whom he loveth, he chastens as he would a child. Okay, God will chase them to get him back on the right path. But they can fight God to the point where God will just kill you and bring you home. So they might stay in a fallen state till they're caught up in death. Or they might stay in a fallen state until we get all get called home in life. I always call this getting caught up in, in death when you die, or getting caught up in life, the catching away of the body of Christ. Right? Some will let God pick them back up. Praise the Lord. And I praise the Lord every time God picks me back up, and every time God picks every one of you back up, brothers of Christ, I praise the Lord. Okay? God doesn't want to destroy us. He does when He chastises us. It's not to destroy us. It's to break our our hearts gotten hardened and whatever sin that we're holding on to and won't let go. It's to break our hands to get our hands to let go of whatever it is we're letting holding on to. It's done to build us back up, to pick us back up again. When I correct a brother in Christ and disagree with some of the brethren, I correct them with love. Okay. Um, and it's done in a way to pick him back up, to get him back going again. Right? Be careful of those that correct people that they just want to destroy them and tear them down to destroy them. Be careful of those people. Okay? Some will let God pick them back up. Brother says Christ. Hermes and Phyllis fell away from the truth into a lie. They have erred. Okay? They have erred from the truth. Right? Today people feel like, I've betrayed the Lord, I've betrayed the Lord. You can still get saved today. It's not an unpardonable sin today. It was only an unpardonable sin when Jesus was physically present on the earth in the likeness of sinful flesh. Why is it not there for the day of the Lord? You say, Brother Philip, why is it there for the day of the Lord? Because in the day of the Lord, it's not capital S, Son of Man, as far as in the likeness of sinful flesh. God has an incorruptible body. He'll be ruling and reigning with the rod of iron. It's not possible for a man to betray him then. But when he was in the likeness of sinful flesh, it was possible for a man to physically betray him while he was physically on the earth. Okay? And that was Judas Iscariot. Turn to 2 Thessalonians 2.4. 2 Thessalonians 2.4. We just did 2.4. Sorry. No, no. 2 Thessalonians 2.4. We keep going. I'm sorry. Who opposes the exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 
Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know that what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. How we know the church doesn't go through this. Verse 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The body of Christ. The word let means you hinder something from going over. You have a net in tennis, and the ball does, hits the net, and the net prevents the ball from going over. It's called let. We're not going into the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, what is letting, what is hindering that man of sin from popping up? Okay. You don't have to turn here, but Revelation 16, 13 says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Uh -huh. You've got the, the beast, okay? We see that there. You have three. You have the false prophet, you have the beast, and you have the mouth of the dragon. That's the true trinity. What's going to happen to the true trinity? Revelation 19, 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that was that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that, that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive in the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So there we got the false prophet and the beast, the, the, the person pretending to be Jesus Christ, betraying God and betraying the Jewish people. Right? But remember, it's a different dispensation. Revelation 20.10 says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire of brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. These are different dispensations. Okay. Now granted, I believe, uh, the reason I mention it is because the beast, Judas Iscariot, is a type of the beast. He's a man that the, the, the devil goes into him, and he betrays Jesus Christ. What's the beast going to be like in the time of Jacob's trouble? Satan's going to go into him, and he's going to pretend he's Jesus Christ, and he's going to betray God, and he's going to betray the Jewish people. They all went to hell. Judas Iscariot. Mm -hmm. This is an unpardonable sin, absolutely. But is it for today? No, it isn't. Okay, Is this an unpardonable sin? Yes, but... But the better question to ask is, is this for today? Can God forgive betrayal today? There's some, bro there's some brethren that turn their back on this book, King James Bible, and grab an NIV for a while, and God convicts them, chastises them, and they come back to the Bible. There's some that say, oh, I believe in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ, which includes believing in uh, the imminent return of Jesus Christ as far as looking for that blessed hope. If they turn their back on either one of those, and I know some brethren who have, get fall into the trap of post-trib, mid-trib, and then they come back to pre-time of Jacob's trouble, time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ. There's brethren that have turned their back on looking. It doesn't say believe. It says looking for that blessed hope. That means you're looking for the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Every day you're looking for him. That's what it means by imminent return. You don't know when he's coming back. Therefore, you're looking for him to come back every day with the life that you're living. There's brethren that have turned their back on that. They've betrayed the Lord, they've betrayed the Word, and they're betraying the brethren. Can God forget that? Absolutely. Can God get you back on the right path? Absolutely. How do we know this? Turn to 1 John 5. 1 John 5. You say, well, we've already been there. Well, we're going to keep going there. 1 John 5. Let's read it again. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. What is our soul connected to? God, Jesus Christ, who is God the Father. Our soul is connected to the body of Jesus Christ, which is connected to God, the soul, God the Father. In him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. All sin, including betrayal. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's only for this time period. Death of Jesus Christ to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the only time period where all sin can be forgiven. All sin. 
There is no unpardonable sin today. You can betray God. You can betray man. You can betray brothers and sisters in Christ. God will forgive you. You have to humble yourself and come to Him broken. You will not lose your salvation if you do this. You'll lose rewards. You'll have a lot to answer for at the judgment seat of Christ. But you can't lose your salvation. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. Can God forgive you if you feel like you betrayed Him? Can God forgive you if you feel like you betrayed a brother or sister in Christ? Oh yeah. God can forgive a betrayal. What that's talking about, brother or sister Christ, is you had a man that was physically present on the earth where Jesus was there, and Jesus said, that man, that man, talking about Judas Iscariot. He said, I brought that one up because some people feel like I've dealt with some people trying to witness to them, and they feel like, God won't save me, I betrayed him. I betrayed him, God won't save me. You have someone who is saved, and they say, well, God, I've lost my salvation because I betrayed God. No, you didn't, if you're truly saved and born again. You did not. And if you're a fake and a fraud, you can still get saved. It's not too late. Can you breathe? Are you still alive? It's not too late. God will forgive any sin today. All right. Here's an important, a, big, a big one again. Get number three. Offending little ones. What does it mean to offend little ones? Let's get to this one. Matthew 18, 6. Matthew 18, 6. Notice where we're at. Are we have, I've used Pauline epistles to talk about some of the verses we have talked about, but when it actually names these unpardonable sins, where do we keep turning? Old Testament. Or a different dispensation. We're not turning to the Pauline epistles initially to start out with. Why? Because it's not for today. But Matthew 18, 6. Matthew 18, 6. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones, which believe in me. Remember that. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. A parallel passage is Mark 9.42. Mark 9.42, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast in the sea. Another one uh, parallel passage is Luke 17.1, Then said he unto his disciple, It is impossible, but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he, were, and he cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Now, here's the thing. I believe when it comes to this instruction and righteousness, people try to grab this and try to talk about little children um, when, um, I hate to say it like this, uh, little children that are sexually abused. Okay? You don't want to, God is going to just turn it up. But what this is mainly talking about is them that believe in me. What is this time? Instruction righteousness it is a sin. Per sexual perversion is a sin in all shapes of form, not just how they do it to uh, per uh, harming children, but how adults, all of that sexual perversion is a sin, period. But they lose sight of what this is really talking about. What is it really talking about? You have parents who told their children about Jesus Christ, who probably raised their children on the Christ. The Christ is coming someday. The Christ is coming someday. And those children are believing with a childlike mentality. They're believing, well, Jesus is a good person. He's the Christ. He's God manifest in the flesh. He's the Christ. And they're bringing their children to him to lay their hands on the children. And they're being told, keep those children away from them. Okay? I believe this can only happen when Jesus is physically present on the earth. Okay? Does this, do I believe this is an unpardonable sin? Absolutely. And the day of the Lord, when Jesus is physically ruling and reigning, we're going to get to some verses that talk about how the whole world, including the children, are told about Jesus Christ. 
You know how today when you get saved, brother says Christ, you find you have children, you learn in the Bible, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be raising my children in the admonition of the Lord. I need to raise my children and teach them about Jesus Christ. I need to teach them about the do's and the don'ts. Okay, instruction and righteousness. I need to teach them about Jesus Christ. So then when they grow up and get to the age of accountability, they can make the choice to choose Jesus Christ or to choose the world. But is that every child today? No. That's only saved sinners that raise their children in the admonition of the Lord. I was at first was raised in the admonition of the Lord. And when I was 11, I think 11 or 12, I got into Awanas and then got into a battle building that still didn't, I wasn't raised in the admonition of the Lord. Some brethren are. They were raised in the admonition of the Lord. I wasn't. Okay? You can still come to the knowledge of the truth and get saved, whether you were raised in the admonition of the Lord or not. But the point of this is, is this is talking about when Jesus is physically present. And we're going to keep reading some verses to prove this. Okay, Revelation 2.27. Revelation 2.27. I've got to make this a point of Jesus Christ and the day of the Lord. Revelation 2.27, And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as a vessel of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I receive of my Father. So that command that we have today, and that what we call the day, of the, uh, the day of the Gentiles, the church age, only as saved sinners, we raise our children in the admonition of the Lord. But in the day of the Lord, when Jesus is ruling and reigning with a rod of iron, it's going to be a command that everybody has to follow. The children will know who Jesus is. They will know his commands. They will believe in him. All children will. All children will. Okay. Revelation 12, 5. We see this over here again. Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Rule the nations with a rod of iron. See, the commands that we have as Christians are for Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women. The lost world isn't going to get it. We don't go to the lost world and command them to raise their children in the admonition of the Lord. We go to them and we tell them about their sin. I'm pointing at the Ten Commandments. We tell them about their sin. The Levitical laws. We tell them about their sin and wickedness. We tell them about the cost of their sin. We tell them about Jesus Christ. We don't go out there telling them that they have to get clean and they have to obey the Bible, the do's and the don'ts, as far as we, the only thing we tell them about obeying the gospel. We preach the gospel to them. But for us, we do this. In the, time, in the day of the Lord, that command goes to everybody. It's all, remember, it's 100% works in the day of the Lord. Right? Is it an unpardonable sin when Jesus was physically present? Yes, I believe that. Is it an unpardonable sin in the day of the Lord? Yes. If you offend one of the children that believe in me. Okay. You say, is that all you got? No, well, I got a couple more verses. Revelation 19.5. Revelation 19.5. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with the rod of iron. And he treadeth the rimepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Okay? Remember, Jesus came, when he's actually talking about this, for these little ones, it's better than a millstone was tied around his neck and cast into the sea, than to offend one of these little ones that believe in me. Okay? Jesus was physically present. And he came to bring in the day of the Lord, the thousand-year reign. The Jews as a whole rejected him. The day of the Lord got put off. When the day of the Lord does come, because it hasn't come yet, don't fall for lies saying it's already happened in the past. It hasn't happened yet. When the day of the Lord finally does come, it's going to go back to being like Jesus was there. The Levitical laws will come back. Okay. He will be ruling with a rod of iron, and everybody, everybody will be held accountable to it. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, we're talking about the children, though. Well, Isaiah 11, 6. Turn to Isaiah 11, 6. Isaiah 
Old Testament. Oops, too far. Isaiah 11.6. No, it's not Isaiah. There we go. 11 verse 6. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. But this is the day of the Lord. Okay, it's going to go back to being like it was before the flood. All animals, I believe, will be vegetarians, as they say. And they're going to be back to being friends of mankind. Today, they fear mankind. And the, day of the, Lord, and the time of Jacob's trouble, they're going to be the enemy of mankind. Okay? They're all, going to, all the animals are going to turn against mankind. They're going to become the enemy. Today, they're just fearful of mankind. Before the flood, they were friendly. I believe they were vegetarians. Anyway, the side and they're going to be friendly. And the and the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Full of the knowledge of the Lord, including the children. As the water cover the sea. When Jesus was physically present, you had people telling their children about him. Like I said, I believe they're telling their children about him and everything. And when they're telling them, hey, keep those children away from him, they're hurting those children's mindset of who Jesus is. He hates us. He doesn't want anything to do with us. Maybe he's not really the Christ. And they're just children. Okay? You're offending the children. That's what Jesus is saying. Okay? that believe in me. They were taught by, by um, people that were faithful to the Christ is coming someday. We've heard about the Christ. I mean, you read stories about it. When, he, when Jesus comes across the woman in the well, we've heard about the Christ. I am he that speaketh to thee. Some weren't looking for him. Some were. Some had taught their children about him. Okay. Now, instruction in righteousness today... Um, when we talk about offending them, whether it's physical abuse, virtual, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, uh, not raising them right in the, in the admonition of the Lord, I'm sorry, but what does the Bible say? Can that be forgiven? Absolutely. Will someone who's truly saved and born again continue in those things? There's certain wicked things that I believe they won't continue in. Okay, God will get it out of their life like that. They won't continue in it. Okay. But is it an unpardonable sin? The way Jesus spoke about it, it sounded like it was. It was better than a millstone was wrapped around a man's neck and tossed in the sea. Okay? Than offend one of these little ones. Uh, it sounds like it. But today, okay, is that for today? Right? Turn to 1 John 5. You say, you keep going back to 1 John 5. You better, better believe it. I'm going to get this drilled in, brothers Jesus Christ. I'm going to get it drilled in here. Not just here, but here, and I'm going to get it drilled in your heart also. Okay? 1 John 5. 1 John 1, I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us all from all sin. If you're lost and you think you've done some very horrific things, sinful, wicked, horrific things, and you think, well, God can't save me. God can. Okay? There's a testimony. I'm trying to think of the guy's name, but the guy was a serial killer. And he was a sodomite. And he ended up getting saved in prison. And accepting his punishment for what he had done physically in this world but he got truly saved, born again, and 180. God can save you. It says here, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This is not a contradiction. It says all sin. That's for today. You have to be dispensational or you're not going to get it. You're going to say, but, but, but what about the blaspheming of the Holy Ghost? What about betraying mankind? What about the mark of the beast? What about the... 
you're going to get all messed up. Today, the, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But remember what Paul said, He that nameth the name of Christ to part from iniquity. There's sanctification. There's a changed life. You're not going to continue in those sins anymore. But God can save you if you did them. Right? God can save you. Right? God, If you're saved, God can forgive you. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just. And I'm talking about all sins. But there's some sins I still believe with my heart that God will get them out of your life ASAP. There is no, I keep falling back into it and I've been saved for 20 years. Okay. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It says all unrighteousness. Cleanse us from all sin. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. His word is not in us. Okay. Brothers and sisters in Christ, understand that I might have not done some of those evil and vile, wicked things like Offend, what would be considered offending a, a, a little one today, a child today, what they try to call offending a child today. Remember that said that believe in Jesus Christ, but offending a child today. I might not have ever been physically abusive, verbally abusive, uh, sexually abusive to a child. Okay, I've never done that. You might have never done that. But by Jesus Christ, we're not to hold ourselves above them and say that makes us better than them and you can't get saved, but I can. Uh, no. You blaspheme the Holy Ghost? I've never blasphemed the Holy Ghost. I mean, according to the Scriptures, blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Have I used the Lord's name in vain? I think I had. I'm pretty sure I had in my lost life. Like I said I wasn't a big. I was raised with clean mouth as far as no cussing. But you watch TV and you start as a kid. You start learning these things from television and um, Hollywood movies and whatnot. And you might. I might have slipped up and said it a couple times. But does that mean I look down on? People that are lost that do those things, that curse, cuss. I, I don't like to hear the cussing. I go, Ugh. but I don't look down. I try to preach the gospel to them so they can get saved. Okay? Can God forgive sins? Absolutely. But remember, that un unpardonable sin, I believe, has to do with the children being raised and taught the knowledge. Remember what we read back there? It said, for, each shall be, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of, of the Lord. That's talking about the day of the Lord. And Jesus was there to bring in the day of the Lord. And he's preaching to them, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's preaching the kingdom of heaven. And when the Jews as a whole started rejecting him, then he started telling his apostles about his death, burial, and resurrection. Okay? The kingdom got put off. But he still had to offer that kingdom. You say, well, if he was God, wouldn't he know that? Yes, but he still had to offer it. He still had to offer it, brothers of Christ. He had to offer them the kingdom. So he had to preach the kingdom and things that pertaining to the day of the Lord. Right. Let's get to the fourth one. Mark of the beast. Mark of the beast. Revelation 14.9. Already kind of close. Revelation 14.9. Very little left. This Bible doesn't have a... Uh, a dictionary or a concordance in the back or nothing. It just ends on Revelation 22. Just ends. It has some blank pages. So it feels like I'm like at the very end of the book. The other Bible has some stuff in the back, so you're not always at the very end. But Revelation 14. This is my large print Bible. That's why they couldn't they couldn't fit anything else in there. It's just large print. I love Bibles without um, concordances. Uh, references, that kind of stuff. I just want to be able to read the Bible without, you know, someone else trying to, you know, and they, not that they're wrong, but the concordance is fine, dictionary is fine. What I'm thinking of is expository. Someone puts in their expository studies and what they believe this means or what they think and everything. It's like, eh, it's okay, but I, I like just this. If I want to learn stuff, I have other books with concordances of brothers in Christ that have done concordances. Okay. When I want to read the Word, I want to read the Word. Uh, Revelation 14, 9. We read, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead, or in his hand. Notice it says, it says, if any man. And remember what we read, because we're going to read it again eventually, 1 John 5, where it said that if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. 
We are still sinners. We're saved sinners. Saved sinners. Could I be tempted into doing something that isn't right? Absolutely. Have I been? Absolutely. Have I failed the Lord? Absolutely. Does that mean I've lost my salvation? No. This says if any man, any man that concludes saved and lost, there is no, once again, where's the clause at? Where's the fine print, as they say, that says, but a Christian wouldn't take the mark. This says if any man, any man, worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. You can't mistake this. You go to hell. Remember what we read about the falling away? In the time of Jacob's trouble, there's going to be a huge falling away. Only in the time of Jacob's trouble, the falling away, you take the mark and you worship the beast. You lose your salvation and you go to hell. If you take the mark and you worship the beast and you're already lost, you will remain lost. God will not save you at that point. You can say, well, I believe, I believe. It won't mean squat. If any man, saved or lost, you take that mark, you worship the beast, you go directly to hell. Not directly. Uh, I, I thought to say like the uh, stupid board game, but do not go past go. You know, the monopoly, do not pass go, goes straight to jail. You go, you're, you're, going, you're, you're doomed to go to hell. There is no hope for you in this time period. Remember, once again, are we reading in the Pauline epistles? No. We're reading a different dispensation. This has to do with the time of Jacob's trouble. It's a seven-year time period called the time of Jacob's trouble. Verse 11, let's keep going. And the smoke of their torment is sent up forever and ever. Hell's forever, brother, says Christ. Don't let anybody deceive you. Oh, hell's the grave. Hell's just annihilation. Hell is forever. As long as God lives, hell is going to be there. As long as God is alive, and we serve a living God, you're going to be punished for as long as He's alive. Hell is forever. Your soul is eternal. Now us, I'm talking about our soul is eternal too, but I'm not talking about us because I almost sound like I was saying we're going to hell. The lost world, anybody that goes to hell, you have a soul that's eternal, and it's going to burn for all eternity. All eternity. It's a special kind of fire that's down there. It's not like the fire we have today. Once it burns out, it goes out. It's, the people always try to liken it to the fire that we have today. Oh, no. Read the Old Testament. Some of the fire that came down from heaven and lapped up the, the water. Uh, with um, Elijah, when he set up the wood, he set up the offering. He had him pour water on it five or six times. He had a moat around it. It was just water galore. And the fire came down and whoosh, lapped it all up. Just like that. Because it's a special kind of fire. Right? It's fire from the Lord. Right? It's not the fire that we have today where, the once, like I have a wood stove, once the wood in there burns out, the fire fizzles out and it goes out. That's not the kind of fire that's in hell. Right? Remember that. Torrent sent forever and ever, and they had no rest, day nor night, who worshipped the beast in his image, and whosoever received the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Is this an unpardonable sin? Absolutely. Revelation 19.20. Turn to Revelation 19.20. Now, here's how you know you're dealing with either someone who's um, a PWC, because I've, like, I've talked to that man for two hours, twice, and it seemed like he was a young man, and it seemed like he was a PWC. He kept pairing what someone else said, because no matter what I showed him in the Bible, comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture, he kept trying to grab the Old Testament. I kept bringing him back to the Pauline epistles. He kept going back to the Old Testament. I kept bringing him back to Old He'd go to Revelation. He'd go to the Old Testament. Mainly, he stuck with the teachings of Jesus when he's teaching the kingdom of heaven. The day of the Lord, that physical thousand-year reign is what Jesus is preaching, and he keeps grabbing that and applying it to today. It's frustrating when you deal with people like that. So you're either dealing with somebody who's ignorant of scriptures and they're PWC, or you're dealing with a snake. And I, hear me when I say this. When it says, if any man, if they sit there and tell you that, oh, Christ, no Christian would take the mark of the beast. You're dealing with a snake. I'm talking about preachers. You're dealing with a snake. You're dealing with a wolf in sheep's clothing. 
Okay. This says, if any man take the mark, the church is not going into the time of Jacob's trouble. Why? Because we just read, and we're going to read it again in 1 John um, 5, 1 John 1, 5, and we're going to read that again, where today all sins are forgiven. Any sin can be forgiven today. So anytime you come across something like this that says, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark, they go straight to hell. If any man, saved or lost, that falls under any man. Young or old, any man. And I'm talking about mankind. Young or old, man or woman. Okay? You take the mark and you worship the beast, you go to hell. If any man, period. Well, that seems to contradict what, what Paul tells us today, where we, and John says for today, because this is John talking about the future, time of Jacob's trouble, and then you have 1 John 1, 5, where it talks about today, God will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You, if there was a mark in a beast to worship today, which there isn't, if the, yes, brothers and sisters Christ could dece be deceived into doing it, and yes, God can forgive it if it was for today, but it's not for today. It's for the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? They don't have that 100% assurance of salvation in the time of Jacob's trouble. They, those that keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ is what's going on in the, in the time of Jacob's trouble. You have to keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. There's faith and works in the time of Jacob's trouble. Today it's faith. Good works follow true conversion, but today it is faith. You fail the Lord, you fail to do those good works, God will forgive you, pick you back up, and put you back on the right path to get you back to doing the good works. Okay? He doesn't just forgive you and you can continue in the, in the bad works. You didn't want forgiveness if you continue in the bad works. If you truly come to Him repenting, God will forgive you today. Okay? Those both were cast alive in the lake of fire brimstone. Okay? Uh, Revelation 19, 20. Let's read it real quick. Um, and the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, deceived them that received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. They deceived them. Okay? If no Christian would take the mark, then they're not deceived. They're deceiving people. Now, don't get me wrong, they can deceive lost people, but it's called deception. That's why it says, if any man, can Christians be deceived today? I mean, just look at today, brothers and sisters Christ. Is it possible? Are we seeing brethren fall away? Are we seeing brethren being deceived today when it comes to the major doctrines, when it comes to instruction and righteousness, when it comes to the Bible version issue? Are people being deceived today with worldliness? Are, there's brethren, the brethren in Christ that's worried more about what's going on in the world, and he's getting so fearful. Why? Because he turned his back on the imminent return of Jesus Christ. He turned his back on looking for that blessed hope. He's not looking for Jesus Christ. He doesn't have his eyes on Jesus Christ. Can God, the new brethren, fall away today? Yes. Can God forgive that today? Yes. In the time of Jacob's trouble, you take that mark, you worship the beast, and any man can do it, saved or lost, in that time period. Any man can do it. And in that time period, the, the salvation is no longer just faith. It's the keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay? They deceive them that have received the mark of the beast, and them and them received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive in the lake of fire. They're going to the same place that anybody that takes the mark and worships the beast. Okay? We know that this is not for the time of the Gentiles, but the time of Jacob's trouble. Luke 21 24 says, Luke 21 24. Luke 21, 24 says, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive unto all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down at the Gentiles, until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Jesus is talking about death, his death, resurrection, to the cash away of the body of Christ. Uh, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violence take it by force. They've been fighting over Jerusalem. Look at history. They've been fighting over that land out there for, for years. For years. 
Okay. For 2,000 years, they've been fighting over that land. Okay. The time of the Gentiles. Why does it separate the time of the Gentiles from the time of Jacob's trouble? Jer Jeremiah 37. You see, where, where do you get the time of Jacob's trouble? Turn to Jeremiah verse 30. Jeremiah verse 30, prophesying the, that seven year time period. Jeremiah 30 verse 7 says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. There are, there are Jews that, have this, that are, that are given the seal on the forehead. And they don't take the mark, and they don't worship the beast, and they are protected during that time period, the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. What we're in today is called the time of the, of the, the, time of the Gentiles, where salvation goes out to the world, and anybody can get saved. And it's faith, through faith, not of works. Remember that, that verse? It says, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It's not in mine, but my notes, but... Ephesians, thank you, Lord. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works. In the time of Jacob's trouble, there's works. They keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. If any man takes the mark and worships the beast, it goes hand in hand. There's works involved in salvation. Today there's not. If you're not dispensational, that's a contradiction. No, it isn't. I'm dispensational because the Bible says to rightly divide the word of truth. The body of Christ is not going into the time of Jacob's trouble. How do we know that? Because you can lose your salvation in the time of Jacob's trouble. There's an unpardonable sin in the time of Jacob's trouble. But is that for today? No. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Good works follow conversion. But good works isn't what saved us. Okay? God's grace through faith is what saved us. And after God saves us, like he said, the old man is dead and buried. You gave your life to Jesus Christ. The new man comes up and says, Lord, command me. And the Lord says, do this. Don't do that. And he shows us through his perfect written word how to live our lives. Good works will follow true conversion. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. It's before ordained that when you get saved and born again, you're going to have a new life, new creature in Christ Jesus. God's going to command. You're going to obey. Right? That's just for us, saved sinners. The lost world doesn't obey God's commands. They could care less about God. But in the day of the Lord, it's going to be different. But the time of Jacob's trouble, we see there, there's works involved. Okay? Now, my question is, where is Paul worried about a mark and worshiping the beast in this time, present tense? Where's Paul warning us about it? Where's John? I mean, John's warning us about it in Revelation, but where's John warning us about it in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, where it's addressing the church today and the, gen the day of the time of the Gentiles? We call it the church age, but the Bible word to use is the time of the Gentiles. Death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ. Where is this being mentioned and we're being warned about it today that it's going to happen to us? No, this is future. Letting us know what's going to happen in the future. Okay? And that book of Revelation and everything is there for the for people, the fakes and the frauds, and the people who flat out reject Jesus Christ. When we get caught up, they end up going into the time of Jacob's trouble. Then that book of Revelation is really going to apply to them, big time. They're going to have to go off of that book to survive, and they're going to have to listen to God's commands to keep from losing their salvation if they truly get saved in that time period. It's not going to be just repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. That's there. But now there's an element of works that gets added. Don't take the mark and don't worship the beast. 
You can, get, you can get saved, but that salvation, you're no longer sealed into the day of redemption. The redemption already happened. Remember that. We're going to get into that verse. Remember that first post of grace? You're sealed until the day of redemption. But after the day of redemption happens, the catching away of the body of Christ, you're not sealed anymore. There is no seal in the time of Jacob's trouble. You take the mark and you worship the beast, you go to hell. So what do these people got to do that aren't dispensational? They've got to make a mess of the Bible and say, well, well, the church goes into that time period then, and, and the catching up doesn't happen until the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. That's nowhere in Scripture. Okay? It's nowhere in Scripture. Okay? We're sealed into the day of redemption, and the day of redemption is the catch away of the body of Christ, which happens before the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? He who now let will let until he be taken out of the way. We are hindering the Antichrist from showing up and starting the time of Jacob's trouble. And I don't say we like we have a choice. I'm saying as long as we're here and God says it's not time, the Antichrist isn't going to show up. The man, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, that time period, that seven-year time period is not going to start yet. When God says, okay, enough's enough, come up hither, then that time period can start. Now, um... There are people who do not take the mark and worship the people who do not take the mark. I want to show this that we just read how if any man take the mark, and we read that they were deceived. Those who took the mark, they were deceived. And they're acting like no Christian today can ever be deceived. You know who normally says that? Wolves in sheep's clothing, snakes, serpents, vipers. Wicked men who are on their way to hell and they want to drag as many people to hell with them. And if you're saved, they want to mess you up as a Christian. Okay? It says they were deceived that took the mark. And who deceived them? The false prophet and the beast. Those are the two that deceived the world and, and most people into taking the mark. But did everybody take the mark? Revelation 15 too. This is not really talked about that much. Okay? Well, no Christian would take the mark. Please. Yes, they would. Okay. Revelation 15, 2. You're dealing with someone who's lost, who says, I'm sorry, it's just, it's so, so self, they're, they're going about to establish their own righteousness. I'm so good, I would never sin against God. If we say we have no sin, we make God a liar, and His word is not in us. Revelation 15, 2. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the songs of Moses, the servant of God. Songs of Moses, the servants of God. And the song of the Lamb, and the song of the Lamb. So you have Jews that make it through that time period, the time of Jacob's trouble. It's predominantly for the Jews. But the song of the Lamb, you've also got... I believe, uh, Gentiles. There's going to be some Gentiles that make it through. Saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name. For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for the judges, for the judgments are made manifest. It's going into the day of the Lord. All the nations will come before him in the day of the Lord and worship him. Absolutely. Okay. You know, turn here, but Revelation 24 says, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their forehead or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So you have people that live through that time period, which is very hard. That's predominantly, I believe, going to be the, the Jews that are sealed in their forehead, or what's going to make it through, predominantly. And you're going to have a lot of people that get saved and refuse to, to take the mark, refuse to worship the beast, and they're beheaded for it. So there are people that don't do it, they don't take it, but it's not, you're, at, you're going to be deceived into believing they're like robots. When the time of Jacob's trouble happens, they're just, they're forced into not taking it. Those who took it were never saved to begin with. Almost like, you know, 
that uh, predestination. They were predestined to go to hell, and these that didn't take it, they were predestined to go to heaven, and they were forced into not taking the mark. That's not there. It's still mankind has a choice. They can choose to take the mark, or they can choose not to take the mark. And the pressure, and the temptation, and the deception to take the mark in that time period is going to be so great. You look at today, and you imagine today, there... I'm in an area where I'm trying to do a garden, I'm trying to hunt, I'm trying to fish, I'm trying to find ways that if we hit hard, hard times, because I believe every day looking for the Lord, but I understand that we might have some hard times. I'm not against that. I'm just against prepping like you're going through the time of Jacob's trouble. You can always go through some hard times. But right now I'm learning skills, and I was doing this before we hit these hard times that we're in today. I've been doing this for five years now, trying to learn this stuff and be self-sufficient because I just think it's better for brethren out there uh, and safer for us if we just learn to be self-sufficient. But I go to the grocery store. Everybody's dependent on that grocery store. You take that grocery store away, what's going to happen to people? Here's a mark. You have to take this mark and you have to worship the beast if you want to get food from this store. Oh boy. Stop and think about that, brother. Everybody, the, uh, I'm just thinking, in, I know I have brethren in other countries, but I'm thinking of the U.S., but even in other countries, when I went to other countries, it seemed like a lot of the families, like when I was in Germany and stuff like that, it seemed like a lot of the families were still more dependent than ever on the grocery stores. A lot of the other countries I was in, it seemed like a lot of them, like the Philippines, they were very dependent on the stores. They weren't, for, as a whole, they weren't providing for themselves. Right? When that gets taken away, and you don't, and they don't know how to how to take care of themselves and provide for themselves, you think that's not going to be a big temptation and a big deception, a big you know push to take the mark and worship the beast? I can't bring it home enough, brother, sister in Christ, that yes, a Christian can take the mark of the beast if a, uh, if a saved sinner today went into that time period. But we're not going to go into that time period. We're not going to. Okay? I am sealed into the day of redemption. It shows that there's, some, there's an unpardonable sin in that dispensation that if you take it, you lose your salvation. But I've already got a promise. And I'm getting ahead of myself because we'll get to those verses. But I have a promise. I'm sealed into the day of redemption. Turn to 1 John 1, five again. 1 John 1.5. Okay. How do we know that's not for today? Okay, first, there is no mark today right now that requires you to have to buy and sell. There's no mark that's in the hand or in the forehead. Okay, or on the forehead. Okay? There's no mark today that's required to buy and sell, and there's no beast to worship. Okay, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, uh, what we call the ultimate antichrist. That's why we call him the antichrist. He's the ultimate antichrist because he will be an antichrist, but he's the ultimate one. Um, he's not here. Right? It's not for today. Is this an unpardonable sin? Absolutely. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, yes. You commit this sin, you go to hell. But the better question to ask is, is this unpardonable sin for today? See, that never gets asked. Just says, is this an unpardonable sin? Yes, it is. So therefore, you can lose yourself. And they just start deceiving you. No. Is this unpardonable sin for today? No. It's for the time of Jacob's trouble. We're in the time of the Gentiles. That's for the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay. Luke 21, 24 reads, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive in all nations. We read this before. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. We're in the time of the Gentiles. The death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble is called the time of the Gentiles because salvation is not just of the Jews, which it was when Jesus was physically there. He said, Jesus said himself, for salvation is of the Jews. But why is it called the time of, G of the Gentiles? Because salvation has gone out to the world. Salvation is no longer just of the Jews. It's for everyone. And the Gentiles get included. Okay? We're not in the time of Jacob's trouble. 1 John 1.5. This is what the time of the Gentiles is all about. 
This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Right? There is a changed life after salvation. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Including the sin, that's what I'm saying, all sin today. All sin today is for, can be forgiven. Anybody today can get saved. Will they get saved? That's a whole nother study. Okay, there's some people that God gave them a chance time and time again. They've had a chance to get saved, chance to get saved, and they themselves have hardened their heart to the point where God says, I'm done offering. Not that they couldn't get saved and they never could. They chose not to get saved. Those are called people with hard hearts, but I still pray for them that God can still break those hearts, the chisel that rock and the stone off those hearts so he can reach the heart. But sometimes we feel like with some people you tell us, like, I don't know if it's possible. He's rejected you so many times, Lord. His heart is so hardened. I don't know if he will get saved. Not that he can't get saved. Will he get saved? Like I said, it's a whole other study. But today, God can save anybody that will come to him broken broken. Whatever's in your hand that you're holding on to for the lost world, whatever's in your hand, we have testimonies, brothers and sisters Christ, of what took us so long to get saved because there were things we were holding on to and God had to break us to get us to let go. There's things in this world that's not worth going to hell. Chisel, some of you have testimonies where God really had to break you hardcore and chisel the stone off your heart to reach your heart because you were holding on to things and being stubborn and hard-hearted. God can save anyone today, brother, says Christ. You have to come to him broken. Remember what the verse says, that they that fall on this rock shall be broken? But whom this rock shall fall on, it will grind him to powder? Oh, yeah. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. We say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his truth is not in us. You have a lost sinner, and you have a saved sinner. The saved sinner is going to live better than the lost sinner, of course, less sin, but we're called a saved sinner because we still have some sin. We're always going to struggle with sin because of this body of flesh until we get caught up and given our incorruptible bodies. And I'm really looking forward to that. And I know you two, our brothers and sisters Christ, are looking forward to that. So we're called saved sinners. Right? We say that, oh, I'm saved now. There's a false movement going around. When you get saved, you're now sinless perfection. Sinless perfect. You're not sinless. God is still cleaning up and getting a lot of bad things out of your life, and you still fail the Lord from time to time. But He still forgives you. You can come to Him and ask for forgiveness today, and He will forgive you for any sin and all, and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Brothers and Christ, if you failed the Lord and you've fallen away, He can forgive you. Amen. Let's get in real quick. It's been a wild video. Let's get into the last one, five. So, Mark of the Beast, not for today. Okay, can any man take it? Absolutely. That includes, in that time period, it's going to be saints. Church means called out assembly. So in that six-year time period, you can hear the word church. But when John's caught up, it's no longer church, it's saints. I hope I got that right. But it's saints or it's church, but there's uh, the church isn't mentioned after John is caught up. Okay, it's saints. We even just read that about how the saints, okay, in that time period. Okay, the body of Christ is not there in that time period. Mm -hmm. So let's get into the sin of unbelief. Here's a big one, so because some people still teach this. The sin of unbelief, the only unpardonable sin today, brothers and sisters Christ, is the sin of unbelief. Is that true? Okay. Now, I understand what some of them are trying to say, and we're going to get into it a little bit more. If you die in unbelief, you go to hell. But as I'm going to get ahead of myself, and I'm going to say this. You die in any of your sins. All your sins are what's sending you to hell. Not just unbelief. All your sins. The sin of pride. The sin of bitterness. The sin of envy. The sin of covetousness. Uh, the sin of fornication. The sin of drunkenness. I can go on, the sin of bearing false witness. I can go on, all your sins send you to hell. Okay, But present tense, while you're breathing, before you die, 
is the sin of unbelief an unpardonable sin? Some people are pushing that. They're trying to say that the sin of unbelief is the only unpardonable sin. Uh, turn to Acts 6. Let's ask Paul. Turn to Acts 6. Paul's a good example. Let's use Paul. Acts chapter 6. We're going to go back to Stephen because guess who's there? And you don't realize it until you actually put two and two together. And you realize somebody's there. Stephen is going around and he's preaching Jesus Christ to people. And someone's there that he's preaching Jesus Christ to and he rejects Jesus Christ. He's now in unbelief. I'm getting ahead of myself. But Acts chapter 6 verse 8. Verse 8, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. He wrought miracles. He did the working of miracles. Whole nother study. Someone, someone taught that working of miracles are still on for today. No, it isn't. Okay, there, there's blessings, but the actual working of miracles was there when God still went to the Jewish people. Acts is a transition book going from preaching... Um, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand to repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. They're still trying to bring in the, the day of the Lord, the kingdom of heaven. Okay, That's still there a little bit. Okay? So you have the miracles being wrought then. Those miracles will be brought back in the time of Jacob's trouble when God goes back to dealing with the Jewish people. Okay, It was there at the beginning and then it came to a point where those, those uh, signs and wonders, gone. And now it's just going to the Gentiles only, for the most part. Right? But it says here, working in miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogues, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, the Alexandrian cult, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Was he speaking? He's preaching Jesus to them. Then they subjoined men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. False witness. People to bear false witness. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witness which said, This man seeth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus, that's how we know he's preaching Jesus to him, of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. They're bearing false witness, but you know he's preaching Jesus Christ. And all that sat in the council looked steadfast on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Mm -hmm. So you got Paul there, uh, Stephen, I'm sorry, Stephen preaching. Let's jump over to Acts 7.51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears. This is Stephen talking to him. Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they have slain them which showed before the coming of the Just One, Jesus Christ, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked, looked up steadfast into heaven, and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see heaven open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Not seated, standing, as if he's going to come back, if they would accept him. Right? But they reject him again as a nation, and God put off the, the day of the Lord until after the time of the Gentiles. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon them with one accord, and they cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And here it is, and the witness laid down their clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon the Lord, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. This is Stephen calling upon the Lord. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not their sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Pardon me. But we see Stephen is witnessing. And if you go to uh, chapter... 
chapter, let's see, chapter 8, when you read chapter 8, try to make sure I get this right. You keep reading, you got Philip, and he's out there preaching the gospel. And this is before Paul gets saved. This Saul, it was Saul, and then it became Paul. So you have other people out there preaching the gospel. Saul knew the gospel. He rejected it. He's now in the sin of unbelief. Can God forgive the sin of unbelief? Okay. Stephen is witnessing for Jesus Christ, and Saul, who later became Paul, was there. You say he did it ignorantly. How many times have you heard that? Oh, he just he did it ignorantly. Well, they don't like to read the whole thing. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Let's go to 1 Timothy. He's talking to a brother in Christ in the ministry. It's Paul writing a letter to Timothy, a brother in Christ in the ministry. 1 Timothy 1.12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. Who was before, there's a changed life. Paul is even showing that, sorry about Paul, uh, yeah Paul. I get Peter and Paul messed up because of PPs. Uh, Paul, he's showing that there was a changed life after salvation. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. Paul was going around killing Christians. Hauling them off into prison. Okay. Persecuted and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly. And they like to stop right there. It says, no, keep reading. But I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Paul was in the sin of unbelief. Well, according to some people, that's an unpardonable sin. Let's keep reading and see if it is an unpardonable sin. Verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. You mean Jesus saved him from the sin of unbelief? Oh, yeah. Paul's talking about salvation, which can only be found through Jesus Christ. God can forgive the sin of unbelief. You have to come to him broken. And cast that unbelief to the side and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Can God forgive the sin of unbelief? Absolutely. Is the sin of unbelief an unpardonable sin? Absolutely not. Now, if you die, what the whole thing was is if you die in your sins, you go to hell. Every one of your sins. If you have sins that aren't washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ, so much as one sin is capable of sending you to hell. It's not that your the sin of unbelief is sending you to hell. Your sins, plural, are sending you to hell. Your pride, your ego, okay, your bitterness, your hard heart of refusing to go to Jesus Christ, humbling yourself and repentance. Godly sorrow for your personal sins that you've sinned against God. To put Jesus Christ on the cross. Your sins are what's sending you to hell. Okay? There's this big push today saying that if you die in the sin of unbelief, it's that sin of unbelief that's unpardonable, and that's what sends you to hell. No, it's all your sins, period, that sends you to hell. Every last one of them that you'll have to answer for, lost people will have to answer for at the judgment seat of Christ. I'm sorry, not judgment. I said it wrong. At the great white throne. You're going to be standing before God. He's going to open up the books. Your name's not in the books. You're going to be judged because we're because Jesus is a righteous God. God the Father manifest in the flesh. He's righteous. He's going to sit there and he's going to point out every one of your sins to prove, those of you that are lost out there, he's going to point out every one of your sins to prove that you deserve hell. Those sins are not washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. They remain. You go to hell. Okay? 1 Timothy 1.12, okay, we read that, unbelief, he says he did it in unbelief. Is this an unpardonable sin for today? <laughs> Once again, okay, they keep saying it's an unpardonable sin, it's an unpardonable sin. Is it an unpardonable sin today, the sin of unbelief? No, it isn't. Are you still breathing? You say, where, where do you think we're going to turn to, brother and sister Christ? Where do you think we're going to turn to? Turn to 1 John 1.5. 
1 John 1 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. It's their sins that prevent them from coming to the light. It's their sins that are going to condemn them and send them to hell. Okay? That God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. It goes back to uh, Romans 8. Being carnally minded and walking after the flesh is walking in darkness. But being capital S, spiritually minded and walking after the spirit is walking in the light as he is in the light. Okay? Verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ. His Son cleanses us from all sin, including the sin of unbelief. I was once in the sin of unbelief. But this is Christ, you were once in the sin of unbelief. Did God save you? Yeah, if you're truly saved. Did God save me? Absolutely. Did God save Paul? Absolutely. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, including the so-called sin of unbelief. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Remember that when you die in your sins, unbelief, every one of your sins are what sent you to hell than the lake of fire. You had to go through the Levitical laws. And we hold that God, Jesus Christ sets up there and he judges the lost world according to the Levitical laws. Did you keep this? Did you keep that? Did you keep this? Did you keep that? Nope, you failed here. You failed there. You failed a million times. People are going to be, the lost world is going to think, go there and they're going to think, well, maybe I, I failed a couple, but I'm, I'm, I'm basically a good person. And they're going to find out how many they actually failed and how many times and how wicked of a person they are. There's no getting away from the great white throne and walking away thinking you're a good person. Jesus is Lord as they get tossed into the lake of fire. Okay. And, and it's very important. You can go... You can go through Jesus Christ, as Paul did, or you can go through the Levitical laws, as most of mankind is going to be doing. They're going to be trying to go through the Levitical laws. I can do it on my own. I'm a good person. I can do it. And they're going to fail miserably. It's the only two choices. You can take the Levitical laws and nail them to the cross. You go to the cross broken and you throw your iniquities at the foot of the cross and say, See those Levitical laws? I failed a lot of them. These Ten Commandments, I failed some of them. Probably guilty at one time of failing every single one. Except thou shalt not kill. So maybe not all of them. Um, I failed some of them. I throw them, they get nailed to the cross. Remember Colossians 2? It's nailed to the cross. Jesus, I can't save myself. And Lord, I'm so sorry for my sins. That I've sinned against you that put you on the cross. That's sending me to hell. Godly sorrow. Okay? That's there. Okay? You can go through those two things. Go through Jesus Christ and the cross, or you can go through the Levitical laws. There's no other way. And here's the big thing. The man that will be judging the world will be the only man to keep all the Levitical laws. A perfect man. The perfect Lamb of God. Jesus Christ. God manifests in the flesh. In the likeness of sinful flesh. He got tired. He got hungry. He was tempted of Satan in the wilderness. He was tempted. But he was perfect. And he will be judging. In order to go to And he went to heaven. Where is Jesus right now? He went to heaven. He's In my father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. He went to heaven. He was a perfect man. You want to go to heaven and you don't want to go through the cross, what Jesus did on the cross? You've got to be perfect like he was if you want to go to heaven. You're going to be judged by a perfect man and held to that standard of perfection. How are you going to hold up lost world? What I mean by you, the lost world. How's the lost world going to hold up? 
Nobody can hold up. I can't hold up. Praise the Lord that he saved a wretched man like me, a sinner. But while you yet believe, uh, breathe, there is hope. Brothers and Christ, when you're, you're still breathing, there's hope for you. No matter how small that hope is, there's still hope for you. If you haven't got it by now, the conclusion is this, brothers and Christ. Remember, brothers and Christ, that 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but should shun and shun and profane and vain babbling, for they will increase into more ungodliness. Rightly dividing. When someone comes in and says, there's some way, there's something that you've done that pre will prevent you from ever getting saved, or there's like a sin, or there's some sin that you've committed as a saved sinner that's going to cause you to lose your salvation, there are wolves in sheep's clothing, or there are people that are being used by wolves in sheep's clothing that are ignorant. Okay? But regardless of what it is, they're not following the scriptures. Okay? They're not rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Turn to 2 Corinthians 11.1. 1. We're almost done, brothers and sisters of Christ. 2 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly. And indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, would the serpent promise Eve? Ye can be as gods, knowing good and evil. Ye can be the authority, final authority. You can say what's right and wrong. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might, wear, might well bear with him. Who's the him? Satan. Where's Satan going to end up? We just read that in Revelation. The false prophet, the beast, and Satan are all going to wind up in the lake of fire. The true Jesus of the King James Bible has a zero tolerance for ten, sin. That's true. But the Jesus that has a zero tolerance for sin, in this dispensation, Jesus who is God the Father, fully and completely, okay, God the Father manifests in the flesh, okay, His blood can cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If He saves you, then you are saved. If you die in your sins without God's shed blood, and the reason we read that is because today there's a lot of false Jesuses uh, a lot of false gospels being preached. There's an antichrist spirit that's going out in the world today. Not the Holy Spirit. Right? But those people, what's preventing those people from being saved is themselves. Not unpardonable sins. Themselves. They could get saved, but they have to come to God broken. Let go of man's wisdom, worldly wisdom, that's preaching false Jesuses, false gospels, Follow their knees before the Lord and follow the scriptures when it talks about the plan of salvation, how to find God's grace today. True biblical repentance, coming to the cross broken, having godly sorrow for their personal sins that they've sinned against God, and throwing the old man at the foot of the cross, giving their life to Jesus Christ, believing that he is God the Father, manifest in the flesh, and that it's God's blood that was shed on the cross, and that blood can wash their sins away and that he died and was buried, and that he rose again the third day, proving he's God, the Father. He's God fully and completely. And he's gone to prepare a place for you. And now you have a changed life. You confess both in prayer and you ask God to save you. Anybody can get saved. I was a false convert. A lot of you brothers and sisters of Christ out there have testimonies of being a false convert, being part of some false religion. Some of you were atheists. Some of you just didn't care. You're just so distracted by worldliness in the flesh. You didn't care about anything. And somewhere along the road, God broke you and opened your eyes to what you really were. A dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner on your way to hell and deserved to go to hell for sinning against God. And He saved you and gave you a new life. A different life than your old one. Okay. If you die in your sins without this God-shed blood... Washing your sins away, you will go to hell and then cast in the lake of fire. It's just that simple. Your sins are what sends you to hell. 
And all your sins are capable of sending you to hell if they are not washed away. The true Jesus Christ, the true gospel, and you don't have the true capital S spirit in you. Holy Spirit. Today God will forgive any sins. If you haven't got that with this whole study, God will forgive any sin today. All these unpardonable sins that we mentioned, they start out in a different dispensation, predominantly the Old Testament. And what you're going to see from when it comes to sins and holding you, uh, these false religions, when they're trying to hold their people in fear of whether they have their salvation, whether they can keep their salvation, they can lose their salvation, all this fear is all about bringing them back under the law, back under works to be saved. Okay. The only dispensation of grace in the Bible that there is no unpardonable sin is today. All through the Bible, when we say dispensation of grace real quick, it's all through the Bible. There's different time periods where God's always dispensing His grace to mankind. From Genesis to Revelation, He's always dispensing His grace to mankind. But how mankind finds it is different in different dispensations. Some is faith and works. Some is works. Uh, some is faith. Today is the only time where it's faith. Through faith and faith only. Okay. People will try to mess that up and say it's faith alone through the whole Bible. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Okay. Only dispensation of grace in the Bible that there is no unpardonable sin, and that is today. Today is the easiest... Uh, I want to say easiest, but if it was so easy, why isn't everybody doing it? Because light has come into the world... And people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They love their flesh. They love their sin. They love their wickedness. That's why they reject the light. You can read that in John 3.16, but keep reading all the way down to like 20, verse 20. Okay. But today is the day that once you get saved, it's the e you can't lose it. You can't lose it. Old Testament, before the death of Jesus Christ, all the way to Adam and Eve, you can lose it. Um... The time, of J uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, you can lose it. The day of the Lord, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, you can lose it. This is the one test, uh, I'm not including eternity, we can't lose it in eternity, but right now this dispensation that we've been told about, we haven't been told much about eternity after the new heaven and the new earth, but right now, this is the one dispensation from the death of Jesus Christ to the catch away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble, that seven year period falsely called the Great Tribulation, is the only time period where you can't lose your salvation. It's the only time period where there's nothing that prevents you from getting saved except you. In the Old Testament, there's sins. You could have done something wrong that prevents you from getting saved. In the time of Jacob's trouble, the day of the Lord. But today, there's nothing, there's no sin that you can commit today that will prevent you from getting saved. God will forgive it. Right. Ephesians 4.30. We read Ephesians 4.30. Got to backtrack. No. There we are. Ephesians 4.30. Ephesians 4.30, it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby, we, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Brothers and sisters Christ, we are sealed until the day that we are redeemed and caught up. You cannot lose your salvation in this time period. You can't. Don't let anybody come and deceive you in thinking that you can lose it. Now, don't get me wrong. I've come across, brethren, that that uh, I've said this before, I've come across people that are false converts. They're professing Christians, but they're not what we call possessing Christians. In other words, they're not truly saved. They like to play Christian, but they don't want to live a life of Christ. There's a difference between someone who was never saved to begin with, and I preach the gospel to them. There's brethren I believe are saved, that they've forgotten who it is that saved them and who it is they serve, and I'll go back to treating them like they're lost and just preach the gospel to them to remind them that they, of who it is they serve. That they're falling away to the point where you're starting to look like the lost world and act like the lost world. Okay? But bottom line, when God saves you, if you're truly saved and born again, you're sealed into the day of redemption. 
There is no unpardonable sin today. There's no unpardonable sin that will keep you from getting saved, and there's no unpardonable sin that will get you to lose your salvation. A, it's not yours to lose. To begin with, it's God's. He's the one that saved you. You belong to Him. Okay. So we read that in Ephesians 4.30. 1 John 5.3. 13, I'm sorry. 1 John 5.13. 1 John 5.13, we read, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. You may know you have eternal life. And that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Brother and sister Christ, today, brother and sister, today, there's nothing, nothing that will prevent you from getting saved. Except you. And this is to the lost people out there that's made it this far, which I doubt it. But for the saved, when you go to preach to the lost world, and you let them know there's nothing in this world that's worth going to hell. And there's no sin that will prevent you from getting saved. You are the one that prevents yourself from getting saved. All sin can be forgiven. There is no sin that you can't sit there at the great white throne and say, Well, I was, I, you know, used the, I, I, um, I took the mark and worshipped the beast. When there was no mark and worship the beast. Or I betrayed the Son of Man. Or I offended one of these little ones. Or I blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Therefore, I wasn't going to get saved anyway. No. You could have gotten saved today. You could have gotten saved today. Your hard heart, their hard hardness, Brother Jesus Christ, the lost world, the hard heart of the lost world, and their pride, and them going about to establish their own righteousness, and them loving darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil is what's preventing them from getting saved. They are preventing themselves from getting saved. Anybody can get saved today. You're breathing, you're still alive, you can get saved today. Like I said, it's a whole other study when it comes to hard hearts. Your heart can get hard to the point where God stops offering and you just, you don't want to get saved. But could you get saved if you wanted to get saved? Absolutely. But the problem we have today is we're dealing with a lot of people that don't want to get saved. They don't want to get saved. They love the world. They love their flesh. They love sin. They love wickedness. Some of them have been uh, promised lies. They believe the, the, believe the lie. They hold the truth and unrighteousness, and God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. They've been promised lies. And they're going to find out someday that they were lied to. And those of us, Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, out there trying to preach the truth to them, we tried to give them the truth, and they rejected it. But do we stop giving them the truth? Absolutely not. If anyone comes to you, brothers, saying there is an unpardonable sin, they are grabbing from other dispensations. That's the first thing you've got to understand. If anybody says there's any, even if they say the, the sin, the uh, unpardonable sin of unbelief, you know what they're doing? They're, they're grabbing the fact that there are unpardonable sins in other dispensations. So if there's unpardonable sins in other dispensations, there has to be an, an unpardonable sin today, right? No, there are no unpardonable sins today. Period. They're still getting distracted by other dispensations. Even when they try to come back and say the unpardonable sin of unbelief. No, it isn't. If you die in unbelief, all your sins send you to hell. Okay. More than likely they are lost, not believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, but also may be backslidden and confused. Try to correct them in meekness. If someone tries to come to you saying, I, I've been told, like I tried to help that one brother, uh, I hope he's a brother in Christ that's just confused. I hope plant some seeds and I hope he learns the truth that we're not going to the time of Jacob's trouble. There is no unpardonable sin today. But try to correct them in meekness. You don't have to turn here, but 2 Timothy 2.25, we did a whole study on this. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God preventure would give them a repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. That's for saved and lost. Okay. Make sure that if someone's professing to be saved and they're trying to tell you something about the Bible, correct them in meekness. If it gets to the point where you realize that you're dealing with a lost person, okay, if that, if that doesn't work, preach the gospel. If, they, if you're trying to preach the truth to them, you realize they don't have the Holy Spirit in them, they don't have a love of the truth, they're just parroting what their lowercase g God says and who they're following. There's a lot of lowercase g gods out there in ministry. Okay? And a ministry, not the ministry, God's ministry, but a ministry. And sometimes 
people in God's ministry can start getting prideful and ego-driven and they become lowercase g gods to people. But when you're preaching the truth to them and it's realized that the, the truth isn't working as far as when you're talking about anything in the Bible, this is, goes for anything, but especially when they're trying to say there's an unpardonable sin for today. Right? When that doesn't work, preach the gospel to them, and then Matthew chapter 15, 14 says, let them alone. Try to preach the truth to them. They don't want the truth as far as what the Bible says about whatever they're talking about. Then you realize you're dealing with somebody who doesn't have a love of the truth, doesn't have the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Bible is spiritually discerned. The Holy Spirit what opens the scriptures to us and teaches us. Then preach the gospel to them. They get most of the time. I get people get really mad at me when I link the gospel to them. They first try to act like they're well, I'm, a, I'm with you. I'm a brother or sister in Christ. And I get to the point where I just get so frustrated with them that they're not going off the scriptures. They're perverting the word. They're not dispensational. They're making a mess here. I just say, well, here's the gospel. And come to find out, they didn't go through the gospel of the King James Bible. They went through easy believism. Okay. If it doesn't work, preach the gospel to them, and then Matthew 15, 14, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into a ditch. I know that for today, there is no unpardonable sin today. There's no sin that God cannot save somebody from. None. Today is the only time period, but you have to come to God broken. He knows there's a difference between can and will he. He can forgive any sin, but will he forgive your sins? You've got to come to him broken, like we did, brother and sister Christ. They have to come to him broken. And if they refuse to come to him broken, if they want to go live, believe that there's unpardonable sins, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, they both shall fall into a ditch. What do we read in 2 Timothy 2.15? You keep reading. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 uh, you read verse 16, which I need, don't have. It says here, but shun profane and vain battlings. If they want to believe it, you go over there. If you want to believe you go through the time of Jacob's trouble, you can enjoy that over there because that's heresy, that's false. Go. You want to believe that you can lose, there's no internal security for today, that there's unpardonable sins for today? Be gone. But shame, profane, and vain babblings. This is after you study, uh, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When you have the truth, you hold on to it and you don't let it go. But shame profane and vain babblings, for they will increase into more ungodliness. And that's all that's going to lead to. When someone believes that there's unpardonable sins, it's going to lead to ungodliness. It's going to lead to messing up the scriptures. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is our foundation. Be careful not to be a PWC. I just want to go over this one more time. With the sin of unbelief, I understand what someone say. If you die in unbelief, your sins are not washed away. They're not washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ, and you will go to hell. Absolutely. But it's your sins that are sending you to hell. The sin of unbelief is still not an unpardonable sin. Paul was pardoned. I was pardoned. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you were pardoned. The sin of unbelief is not an unpardonable sin. We just see unpardonable sins in every dispensation except for this one. We think, and some people just feel like we've got to have one for this. The people want one for this dispensation, so I'll make one up for them and give them one. No, there is no unpardonable sin in this dispensation. You reject Jesus Christ and refuse to come to the cross broken, and his blood's not covering, washing your sins away. You go to hell because of your sins. Right. So sorry this was so long. Uh, so great. I'll end this real quick. With grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. Stay in the book. Pray for one another. And I'll see you in the next video.